Come on, cat. What do you think it is? <laughs> I love my Ben Shapiro. Now that's what a cat would say. Got you there, didn't I? from me. How you doing? I think you would know what ICC and RTP stands for. International Criminal Court, Responsibility to Protect. Looking up ICC on Bing gives me International Cricket Council. Wonderful. Google does the same thing. Very nice. And this is why we deserve what we deserve. And there's also the International Code Council. Look at these. We get the International Cricket Council, the International Code Council, International Chamber of Commerce. There it is. It took us about, what, how many links? So here, one, two, three. It's the fourth one. Very important. About the court. The International Criminal Court investigates and, where warranted, tries individuals charged with the gravest crimes of concern to the international community. These atrocities are, but not exhaustive to, but legally they are, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crime of aggression. They're missing something. I would say there's crimes against humanity, there's war crimes, there's genocide. Ethnic cleansing. I guess I would fit under crime of aggression. That's what I was taught. Different terminology. Uh, the Kofi Annan. This cause is the cause of all humanity. Thank you, Secretary General. Am I the guy who questioned rules victims? We're not going to be talking about that ever, by the way. You coming in here in good faith? Oh, this was bound to happen. Oh, well. So, some context. Because I want to satisfy you, at least. You're probably going to be, like, the only person talking about this. Wait a second. Didn't you join my Discord? 
He did. Uh, I thought this was a safe space from that kind of nonsense on Twitch. Uh... You know what? I feel like for you, Cat, I won't talk about it then. And that, that helps me. <laughs> it saves me a lot of time. It's almost 9 o'clock. So today we're going to be watching this lecture. Lecture 13 by Ian Shapiro from Yale. We're going to be talking about the International Criminal Court and responsibility to protect. This blurb right here in the description is a pretty good overview of what we're going to be doing. So in this lecture, Professor Ian Shapiro provides an international law background on non-intervention discusses what the ICC, International C Criminal Court, and R2P, Responsibility to Protect, are, and how radical they were for a refashioning of the legal and political order, as well as go over the roles played by interests, institutions, and ideas in the establishment of the ICC and the R2P. If you want to know more about the ICC, Kabushk, here's a link, as well as Responsibility to Protect, um there's a there's a un thing right here boom kablammy and as a uh something to go along with what we are going to be watching today this wednesday i'm going to be reading the past present and future of intervention it's a piece that i have read for uh was supposed to be my honors thesis but that didn't go over well. Uh, I'll have the document. It's blocked. Could not find it on the internet for you guys. But uh, I have the document. And I'll be putting that onto my Discord. For everybody who wants to use it as a reference. And I'll also be adding it onto my reading list. Because this is a pretty good overview of just intervention in general. If you, have, uh, if you want to hold a position on intervention. I recommend you reading this um, in order to influence your position because it will go over what was past, the present, and the future of intervention. <laughs> Literally, the title. Uh, but it's definitely going to give, I think, most likely, a new clarity on intervention, especially in the past. Uh, reason being is because I didn't know a lot of details of the past. Okay, so. Boom. We're going to be watching this in 1.25 time speed. But nobody can complain. And... Uh, questions. I love questions. Confusion. I love confusion. I'm going to be confused as well, but since I've had a background in this kind of stuff, one, I'm going to be relearning a lot of stuff. Two, I'm going to be, uh, I've already learned a lot about this stuff, so I could give context, I could put things in layman's terms, I could elaborate on ideas, concepts. Think of me as your senpai. Or think of me as your TA, your teacher's assistant to this. Uh, Livia Slave Markets, Venezuela, 1984, though. Slavery is going to be mentioned in that article, if I recall correctly. Slavery is a big part in the past of intervention. So again, we're going to be watching this today. On Wednesday, I'm going to be reading that article. That's related to what we're going to be learning about today. And Saturday is anime movie night. I don't know what movie we're going to be watching. That's because... Ooh. Um... Whatchamacallit. Uh, that's because... It's viewer's choice. So... If you... You could, you could pick. You guys are the ones who pick what we're going to be watching on Saturday. Uh, last Saturday, I watched... Uh, something of the heart. Fuck. I'm forgetting. I'm just going to go back to 
but uh, scroll down, down, down. Whisper of the Heart. This is what we watch. We watch Whisper of the Heart. Uh, it was two hours of nothing, but it was like two hours of awesome nothing. It was the cutest two hours of nothing ever. Uh, it's a 2013 article, so the present part can go into what uh, tends to dominate online discourse on intervention in your experience. I see. Well, that's why uh, I particularly picked that article out of the many. So because... I guess I could talk more about this. So because I uh, had to study or I tried to write my honors thesis in on intervention, I have a lot of articles. Where It's in academia. What the fuck am I doing? Go to intervention. Yeah, I have like all of these things. These are... Uh, there's just the beginning of my sources for my honor thesis. So I have a lot. And I was thinking, wow, uh, which one should I pick for this week? And I ended up picking uh, this one. No, not that one. This one. So let's see if we could. Here's an abstract. Just to give you guys a sneak peek of what we're going to be reading on Wednesday. Despite the prominent place of intervention in contemporary world politics, debate is limited by two weaknesses. First, an excessive presentism. And second, a focus on normative questions to the detriment of analysis of a longer wrong sociological dynamics that fuel interventionary pressures. In keeping with the focus of this special issue, and if I recall correctly, the special issue is in reference to uh, responsibility to protect on the ways in which intervention is embedded within modernity, this article examines the emergence of intervention during the 19th and 20th century, assesses its place in the contemporary world, and considers its prospects in up upcoming years. The main point of the article is simple, although intervention changes in character across time and place. That's right, the reason why... The article is titled The Past, Present, and Future is because intervention in the past, intervention in the present, and intervention in the future no doubt will be different and are different, which is why it is worthy to examine. It is a persistent feature of modern international relations, and as such, intervention is here to stay. That is a bold claim, this right here. What's up, dude? Was the honors thing the one you didn't get to finish because of COVID? That's right. The honors thesis was going to be my magnus opus. I was very excited to write my honors thesis. It was going to be my pride and joy in my undergraduate years. But COVID hit. I got super stressed. And honestly, it was also a bit of laziness because I got back home. I was supposed to finish my honors thesis at home. But then... I just couldn't work at home. And I ended up dropping it. It was very sad. I was... I, I still regret it a little bit to this day. Uh, but there was just all, no way that I could have finished it. Uh, <laughs> there was also just no way that I could have... That I could have pushed myself to finish it as well. Hey, North. How you doing? Understandable, but at least you have some of the work to show us now. I kind of do. <laughs> Wait. Um, shit. I, I wonder... Hold on a second. I wonder if I could read you guys my drafts. I need to go to my Geneseo account. I wonder if it's still here. What if it's not? It's an old terrorism one link. Working paper. Rights, liberties. Aw. What the heck is this? What are these? I don't even know what these are. I'm looking at my old... Oh. Look at these. Honors thesis, literature, meeting notes, work cited, writing. I had a write. Oh, I had a summary. I had some, I had some writing. My abstract, I had a background. Holy shit. I did some stuff. Yeah. I did stuff, guys. 
This was going to be my title, International Intervention in Peace Operations, Why It Fails and How It Can Succeed. <laughs> yeah, uh, this was going to be uh, my piece on uh, fixing the world one way or another. Looking at this makes me want to revitalize it. Yeah, but it was an honors thesis. I get 40 pages, so... And I'm a normative person too, so I was going to write in the shoulds. Uh, I was going to make prescriptions as students, but of course, yeah, you know, it's an honors thesis, but it's also an undergraduate honors thesis. It's a big deal for a person who is in undergrad, but it's also uh, like a. Uh, I guess one third of a PhD yeah. gets a taste, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of thought. Uh, and on honestly, like I'm probably, if I read this, okay. So the international community utilizes a number of tools to address issues of war, peace, and generally conflict. One of these tools is international intervention, but in the contemporary, it is viewed as problematic. For example, it risks worsening the situation or destabilizing the region. The concerns are real, given that the history of intervention is full of failures and little of success stories. The tool, however, should not be abandoned because it is able to address the predicament of sovereignty when states compromise peace and harm or fail to protect their own people. I will specifically focus on UN peace operations because it is the legitimate form of international intervention. The paper's overall objective is to provide reforms to intervention and peace operations and answer and answers two questions. One, why do international interventions slash peace operations fail? And two, how can they succeed? I identify three reasons as to why they fail. The obstruction for the political bureaucracy, the constant use of one-size-fits-all models, the disconnect of the elements of peace operations, peacekeeping, peace enforcement, and peacemaking, and peace building that are fundamentally interconnected. I will then provide a framework to international interventions slash peace operations that address these problems and more that is centered around a human rights approach and sustainability. Wow, yeah, incredibly ambitious. So, this... Today's stream is kind of personal and kind of an expert on it. <laughs> kind of. Someone asked me about the Destiny of Earth Wolf debate the other day. I said I had a little more to add that Chow hadn't already covered and referred them to you. Wow! Who is this person? <laughs> but if you have more to cover, man, I want to know what you have to say. Uh, if we have time afterwards, well, I'm probably going to have time afterwards. This is one, one hour and 11 minutes. Uh, I haven't even touched that footage yet. I really should. I've, I've been incredibly busy these past couple of days. Oh, there's something on my mind. Boy, oh boy. That's something that I don't care about and that you guys shouldn't care about either. So, uh, press play. We're going to continue with the uh, part two of the course on the new or emerging global order after the end of the Cold War. We've spent two lectures on democracy and particularly the... Um, enormous promise that democracy seemed to offer, which was sort of, um, uh, for which the South African transition was something of a poster child in 1994. This was, after all, before the mixed legacy uh, of the South African transition, and particularly the uh, failure to achieve much for transformation in the economy that would play itself out in later years. In 1994, um, there was, it was, uh, it was really seen as the poster child for this democracy that was sweeping the world, including in places where it had not been anticipated. Today we're going to be talking about the uh, International Criminal Court. Cool, International Criminal Court, ICC, but look at that tie. It is so slick. The Puro, my dude, where do you get your ties? I want to know. And the responsibility to protect. Uh, two doctrines that began a fundamental reshaping of the international legal and political orders. And that's going to really uh, consume us for the next several weeks. Um, 
next several lectures, I should say. Um, anyone know what this is a picture of? Oh, no. Who are these people? Oh, no. It's, it's Rwanda, yeah. Who are these people? Oh, no. Hutu, uh, what, what are they doing? How do you know? What, 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 what are they doing? They're going along with sticks. And who are these people? UN, yeah, these are UN peacekeepers. What are they doing? Nothing. Um, so this is, this is, um, this is a, Yikes. they're watching. Ross um, already. So this is a famous uh, photograph that appeared in The Guardian on the 12th of April, uh, 1994, and uh, did the 1994 equivalent of going viral. The, of course, the rules of engagement for UN peacekeeping troops was that they could not become involved in ongoing conflicts. And yes. so, in effect, they were, they were not in a position to do, to do anything about it. And so, this is, uh, uh, you could call a subtitle for today's lecture, Rwanda's Shadow, because this was a, a horrific genocide in, in uh, the course of which, in about three months, somewhere between 800,000 and a million uh, Tutsi were, mostly Tutsi, some moderate Hutu and some other groups, were slaughtered, and uh, in the most uh, graphic, and much of it appeared in, in the Western media, um, you, can, you can go up and if you try and look on YouTube, you'll have to sign in your, confirming your age because it's, a lot of it is so gruesome. Yes, and, and I um, could get banned so the, on Twitch the, the if you saw anything that, that's gruesome um, in this lecture, Shapiro. Some, the international community had to be able to respond. You know, after World War II, we heard these phrases like, never again. This was a, a clear case of, of genocide. And if the international community couldn't do things uh, to stop it, uh, it was, it was likely to uh, proliferate. Genocides were likely to proliferate. This, what I had taught you earlier about the, the sort of frozen in place international structure of the Cold War was gone, and it was not clear that um, the, the major powers would police their uh, surrogates in ways that would prevent this kind of violence. It's really quite a dramatic counterpoint when you think that the very same month, uh, 2,300 to, miles to the south, the South Africans were having their first uh, democratic election, three days of peaceful voting, uh, again, all this euphoria, while at the same time this carnage was going on in Rwanda. I wonder Let's if he's listen be talking to about President Clinton uh, on the 22nd of July, just the after trials. it was more or less over. Hey everyone, welcome what to Forward. What the we heck? Already... I don't know. I have just met with my national security team. The flow of refugees across Rwanda's borders has now created what could be the world's worst humanitarian crisis in a generation. It is a disaster born of brutal violence, and according to experts now on site, it is now claiming one life every minute. Today, I am announcing an immediate and massive increase in our response. We will provide personnel and equipment to enable these airfields to operate on a 24-hour basis. Our aim is to move food, medicine, and other supplies to those in need as quickly as possible. I've directed the Pentagon to establish a safe water supply and to distribute as much water as possible to those at risk. Safe water is essential to stop the outbreak of cholera and other diseases that threaten the refugees. I've ordered the State Department and our ambassador to the United Nations, who is here with us today, to take immediate action to help create those conditions. The United States will support and urge the immediate deployment of a full contingent of United Nations peacekeepers to Rwanda to provide security for the return of the refugees. We are making clear to the new leaders of Rwanda that international acceptance, including American recognition, depends upon the establishment of a broad-based government, the rule of law, and efforts at national reconciliation. We're taking action to counteract the propaganda of the extremist Hutu elements who continue to urge Rwandans to flee. Taken together, these steps will help to relieve the suffering of the Rwandan refugees and create conditions for their return home. As I so, President Clinton was heavily criticized after that speech, and the reason he was heavily criticized was not for what he said, but for what he didn't say, and indeed for what the administration had systematically been refusing to say throughout the buildup and then the unfolding of the Rwandan crisis. That was the... Yeah, so... 
No, I talked to him. That brings up a great point because one of the reasons why the Clinton administration was really hesitant in responding to the Rwanda genocide was because of how bad Mogadishu was and the public opinion on American intervention at that time was really, really low. And Clinton was really, really scared that if he was going to uh, try to do anything with Rwanda, that it was going to harm his image and things like that. This is kind of, a, you could say, a negative aspect to democratic credibility when it comes to a, a democratic leader's ability to uh, intervene because they have to juggle around both uh, their, their want to maybe uh, intervene, but what often comes in order to slide that back is public perception of their own citizens. And it, it turns out that that was uh, a, a deep regret because after 100 days of the Rwanda genocide, uh, Cl the Clinton administration ended up intervening. <laughs> And thus, if they intervened 100 days after, then why couldn't they intervene 100 days before? Kind of, kind of feels a, a bit weird. So, uh, yeah, Mangadishu, great point. Mm -hmm. a domestic appearances over foreign affairs often and it seriously undermines the legitimacy of U.S. presidents. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Wonderful point in the North. Definitely one of the negative aspects to democratic credibility. The word genocide. He refused to say genocide. And you can now find in the archival documents, there was a lot of back and forth within in the administration where uh, huge resistance to using the word genocide on the grounds that that would, that would dictate that we would have to go and do something. Um, and what Ian Shapiro means is that if we refer to it as a genocide, that means we recognize it, one, as a genocide, we legitimize it as a genocide, and we also imply that if we do recognize it as a genocide, that we have to act upon that genocide. That's why they didn't want to use the word, and a lot of the times, instead, they would use words like, they would use phrases such as acts of genocide, and acts of genocide does not equal genocide. Really weird, but that's how uh, language and legitimacy works. North, on top of his previous comment, is or her, actually, I don't know. Uh, especially if those presidents emphasize things like human rights, other principles based policies. And if they fail, if they fail, it's, e it's, e it's even worse. Americans do not like it when we go overseas and fuck up. So it's really important for any U.S. president, if they want to do anything foreign, for it to be a success. Because if it's not a success, it's a waste of taxpayer money. And that is going to affect your re-election, or that is going to affect your approval rating. That's going to affect how you're going to be written about and talked about in history. And President Clinton was extremely reluctant uh, to do anything to get American troops involved in this conflict because he had had his nose badly bloodied six no. months earlier in Somalia, oh, in the, in the so-called Battle of Mogadishu. And so the there U.S. was, this had started under the Bush senior administration. The, the, the U.S. had been a, a leading, the leading player in, in the U.N.'s peacekeeping operation in Somalia, called the U.N. operation in Somalia. And um, it was an ongoing civil war. And as part of that um, effort in a, what was widely seen as a badly botched American operation, uh, two Black Hawk her helicopters had been shot down and uh, the, the so-called Battle of Mogadishu proceeded in which 18 Americans were eventually killed and 73 wounded. And uh, from the point of view of the administration, what was especially damaging was three dead Americans were uh, dragged, or dead or dying Americans were dragged through the streets of Mogadishu and filmed being so dragged. And this went, the, uh, was uh, again, the 1990s version of, of going 
viral. Uh, it, was, it was seen as um, huge incompetence on the part of the, of the American administration. Probably the most damaging thing for Clinton, uh, at, least, at least the most damaging thing for an American president, at least since Jimmy Carter's botched operation to free the hostages in, uh, in Tehran in 1979, when we also had helicopters coming down in the desert. And in fact, in uh, the 18 Americans killed in uh, the Battle of Mogadishu was the largest number of US fatalities since the Vietnam War. So it was seen as a really big deal that would eventually be surpassed in the second Battle of Fallujah that I talked to you about some time ago, where some multiple of that uh, was killed. I think about 95 American soldiers were killed in that battle. But at the time, this was seen as a, a horrific mess that the US had gotten into, and the Clinton administration had responded by deciding to get out of Somalia rapidly. And so uh, they pushed the UN, essentially, to declare the end of the Somalia operation uh, the following year, and they were in the midst of withdrawing from that. So the last thing the Clinton administration wanted to do was get American troops involved in another civil war where uh, they could have taken a, a massive domestic political hit. And so it's not surprising, even if it's uh, not impressive, that President Clinton refused, and the administration refused to call the, uh, what was going on in Rwanda genocide and refused to get involved until the conflict was, Good description. for all practical purposes, uh, over. So today's agenda is we're going to look at non-intervention, this idea that has to be broached if we're going to start talking about uh, pre protection of international human rights in the post-Cold War world. We'll dig into what the ICC and the doctrine of responsibility to protect are, how they, how they came to be uh, adopted, and what force they have in the world. Um, we'll ask the question how radical a reshaping this is of the international political and legal order. And they're both Huge. very much doctrines in, in evolution and in flux. So to some extent, we're looking at, a moving, at moving targets, but we will, we will do the best that we can. And as we go through, the, I, I want us to pay particular attention to the uh, three I words, to the role of ideas and ideals on the one hand, of um, institutions, we're talking about changing institutions, uh, uh, secondly, and thirdly, the role of interests and how they play out as these ideas and institutions are uh, come under pressure to be reshaped. All right, think about the three I's. Interest, realism. Institutions, liberalism. Ideas, constructivism. It all matches together. And the, the place you have to start, if you're thinking about the international protection of human rights, is the, the strong presumption against intervention in another country by external players. And um, this hasn't always been there. In fact, uh, if you read my colleague Ona Hathaway and Scott Shapiro's book uh, in, in the law school, they will tell you, and they, they are uh, right about this, that the idea that um, national sovereignty is completely inviolable, doesn't become... Oh no, Chow, you didn't mention Marxism. Shut the, Shut the fuck up. <laughs> ...fully entrenched in international law until the UN Charter is adopted after World War II. And the UN Charter was, was centrally about preventing in, in the innov innovation of one country by another and preserving, in that sense, the, the, na the na nation state status quo in the world after World War II. Um, and so the, the idea, Ooh, the, the norm has their that phone. Uh, no, no nation uh, can intervene in the activities of any other nation becomes enshrined in the UN Charter and almost is its part of its raison d'etre. Because what we need... All right, right here. This is the uh, non-intervention clause, Article 2, Clause 7. Trying to... Hello, excuse me. Okay, this is as big as I could get it. Nothing contained in the present charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state or shall require the members to submit such matters to settlement under the present charter. But this principle shall not prejudice the application of enforcement measures under Chapter 7. And Chapter 7 is uh, what I believe to be the United Nations Security Council chapter. Why was this clause, this non-intervention clause, put into the UN Charter? The logic was, is, if you had countries 
to not intervene in other countries, we would stop a lot of the wars. And within the UN Charter bum, 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 preamble, give it to me. Or preamble to the Constitution. <laughs> That's not what I can. Uh, we the peoples of the United Nations determined, and yeah, sounds sound familiar, we the peoples, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. The twice in our lifetime are the two world wars. That was the first part of the UN Charter. It's a pretty big deal for the United Nations to prevent war as much as possible. And so the logic is, if we just have countries to stop going to other countries, to just not intervene, to not cross borders, and to have an international organization that has a, an aspect of non-intervention, we would stop a lot of wars. But there's a predicament. Need to remember. And this predicament is what happens when a country within its borders are committing atrocities. For the sake of non-intervention and for the sake of technically not going to war, do we idly stand by? Remember, when we talk about the UN, talked about this briefly at the beginning of the course, but the purpose of the UN was not to be a world government. The purpose of the UN first and foremost, was to prevent another war between the major powers. This is why it was structured in the way it was, and this is why the Security Council, um, which is the closest thing to the executive body of the UN, was structured the way it was, with the five um, victorious dominant uh, powers at the end of World War II having a veto, a veto uh, over anything that the Security Council did, and the, the notion was that it would be better to force them to cooperate um, by having to agree before any international action could be taken. And when international action was taken, the default presumption was that the, the term of art was to restore international peace and security. And the idea of restoring international peace and security was to, to stop wars, to stop invasions, to stop anybody from trying to um, grab real estate uh, in, in the world. Of course, it came to take on many other roles, but that was the initial purpose of the UN. It's why it was structured the way it was. And we should also remember that it was basically a, a creature of a treaty, a multilateral treaty. In this sense, its basic structure is like the basic structure of the EU. Um, even though we saw with the EU there were, there were efforts uh, around the time of Maastricht to make the, the European Union, uh, the parliament elected by the citizens of Europe, sovereign, that didn't work. And by the time we got to the Lisbon Treaty, there was uh, the Lisbon Round, there was basically modification of this treaty-based structure. So the UN is based on a treaty. And that, of course, means if you want to change it, you'd have to negotiate a new treaty, at least in principle. Um, and the treaty created this structure whose initial raison d'etre was to prevent war, and certainly to prevent war, between the major powers. So a big part of the question, given that the UN is, is the sort of presumptive international institution in the world today, is uh, can the structure of the UN be changed, and if so, how? And what's interesting about the ICC, and particularly... What's interesting about the ICC and R2B, and I want to make sure that this is clear, is that they're not UN things. The Rome Statute is separate from the United Nations. It's its own treaty. And responsibility to protect was from the World Summit in 2005, not the United Nations. That's why we call them common law. The doctrine of responsibility to protect, is we might characterize them as sort of common law efforts, or quasi common law efforts to change the basic structure of the UN. Um, to make it operate as more of an authorizer for intervention, in, in much more radical intervention in the case of R2P than in uh, the ICC. But nonetheless, to make it possible for uh, this idea that nobody intervenes in the activities of any country uh, to start to be questioned. So um, let's talk about the ICC first. If you think about the, the, uh, the idea of holding war criminals to account for their crimes, Previously, there had, there had been talk going back all the way to 1919 
of the idea that there should be some kind of international criminal court. Came up again at the end of World War II. Um, but if you look at what was actually done, we, we had uh, previous tribunals were all ad hoc tribunals. So we had the International Military Tribunal, commonly known as the Nuremberg uh, Trials after World War II. The International Military Tribunal for the Far East, less well known, but the Tokyo Trials for Japanese war criminals. We had the Eichmann trial in 1961, I believe it was, in Jerusalem, where Israel uh, captured Adolf Eichmann and brought him uh, in Argentina and brought him and tried him in, and executed him in Jerusalem. And then we had the, uh, in 1993, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, again an ad hoc, this time created by the UN for the first time, um, tribunal to try war criminals from the Yugoslav conflict and then the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda that was created after the Rwandan genocide to, to try criminals for the Rwandan uh, in the, during the Rwandan genocide. Uh, so they were ad hoc. The last two you see UN action. Uh, uh, before that is essentially uh, victor's justice. It was often criticized as being, and certainly by people on the other end of it, when the winning powers in conflict um, held uh, trials of uh, people from the defeated side. So there was no, act, no international body that could, could engage in these kinds of trials. The, the International Criminal Court was initiated by the Rome Treaty, which was signed by 120 countries in July of 1998, and finally ratified by 60 of them in 2002. It had, it, so it, and it has a strange relationship toward the UN, because the, the structure of the UN was such, as I said to you, uh, they couldn't create a court uh, without going back uh, to, to the signatories of the treaty. Uh, but they, they had um, uh, a strong interest, they thought, or many people at the UN had a strong interest in trying to create uh, some sort of inter permanent international legal tribunal. And so they, they commissioned a group of, of lawyers uh, called the International Legal uh, Council, International Legal Committee, I can't remember the exact title, but these are our experts in international law appointed by the UN General Assembly, and they asked them to draft a statute that could become the basis for an international criminal court, and they, they did uh, indeed do that, and um, the, the UN General Assembly sponsored multiple debates of this statute, and eventually a conference which led to the Rome Treaty. And the UN General Assembly was by no means alone. A variety of uh, NGOs were involved in this as well, NGOs pushing for the creation of norms that would uh, change international law so that uh, perpetrators of war crimes could be held to account. It came into operation in July of 2002 um, when 60 states had signed it. Uh, and today there are 129 states mm. are now uh, signatories uh, of, the, of the multilateral treaty that creates the ICC. So it's independent of the UN, technically, uh, and it's, it's a separate treaty uh, that, that is the foundation document, uh, the statute that creates this treaty, the, this, this institution. Um, it can prosecute, uh, originally it was war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide and a crime of aggression. Uh, was added in, in 2010. It has a pretty broad jurisdiction in that it can prosecute crimes uh, in any of the, that occur in any of the signatory countries or crimes that are perpetrated by uh, citizens of any of the signatory countries. Um, generally speaking, uh, crimes are referred for prosecution by the countries themselves, perhaps after a transition, uh, for example, when there's uh, uh, limited ability of the existing legal order to go after people, perhaps because they are not there anymore, uh, or for, for perhaps because the country's in a civil war, doesn't have developed judicial capacities. This is not the only way that they get uh, crimes referred to them, but it has, it, it, it has 18 judges who are elected by something called the Assembly of State Parties, which are the, the signatories to the treaty, and they sit in three different chambers. One does pre groups of three judges, one does pretrial hearings, one does the trials, and one d does the appellate work. Um, I say it's, it's a parallel but sort of independent institution in that um, actually the UN Security Council has begun to refer cases to the ICC. This, um, this happened after Darfur when the Security Council uh, referred 
uh, some, some cases there. And once a case is referred, there's a prosecutor for the ICC who does a preliminary investigation to see whether charges should be brought. And then in 2011, the, uh, in, in, the, in the Somalia, uh, in the Darfur referral, the US and, um, and uh, China uh, abstained. And this was partly because the US and China are not signatories uh, to, the, to the ICC for reasons I'll get to in a minute. But in 2011, the Security Council unanim unanimously referred Gaddafi uh, for prosecution uh, by the ICC. And as um, Mark Mazawa comments in the, in the chapter that I had you read for today, this is part of what has provoked a lot of commentary about the hypocritical attitude of the, UC, of the US toward the um, uh, UCC. Because on the one hand, we have not signed the treaty and we refuse uh, we refuse to be subject to its jurisdiction, and indeed, in peacekeeping operations, if, uh, if, the, if the Security Council authorizes peacekeeping operations, the Americans require that their soldiers cannot be subject to the jurisdiction of the ICC as conditions for participating in peacekeeping operations. So it's not, it's not a legal system which, to which the U U.S. will submit. Uh, on the other hand, here, they're participating in referring uh, others to the Security Council, most uh, dramatically, Gaddafi in 2011. So um, how important is this institution? Uh, as of 2019, it had handed down 44 indictments. It had uh, arrested, it, it had given out, uh, it had issued 36 arrest warrants. It had 23 ongoing proceedings. Um, there were 15 fugitives at large who had had, had arrest warrants out for them. 21 proceedings had been completed. So this is what are we, from 20, 2002 to 2019, so in 17 years, six people had been convicted, four had served prison terms and been released, two were still serving them. The rest had been acquitted, charges had been dismissed, charges had been withdrawn or uh, otherwise uh, fallen apart, and four, four people had died before trial. So tiny numbers, tiny numbers you might say. Um, how should we then think uh, about it and its, its legitimacy? Well, um, one thing to say about it is that it's, it's long been criticized, as in, particularly in the global south, as heavily biased against African countries. All the convictions to date have been of uh, people in African countries, and virtually all the prosecutions. There's a very good, Wiki, not every Wikipedia page is good, but there's a very good Wikipedia page which gives a uh, running account of all the prosecutions currently uh, ongoing, and it stays up to date. And the, the, the sense that it was anti-African became um, um, a source of a lot of criticism of it. And, and indeed, even today, although uh, prosecutions have been open, in, uh, one in Myanmar and one in, in Georgia, but, but, but the vast majority of them uh, are, are African countries. And uh, in 2016, Burundi, South Africa, and Gambia all said that they were going to leave. Uh, uh, there was then an election in Gambia that uh, reversed that decision after the new government came to power. In South Africa, interestingly enough, uh, was the Zuma government that said they were leaving, but the South African Constitutional Court ruled that it would be illegal for South Africa, it would be un illegal, un unconstitutional for South Africa to leave. So they rescinded their decision to leave. Um, but the Philippines, after Duarte's uh, anti drug. Um, uh, efforts where he, people are very violent anti-drug uh, campaign there uh, was re, there were referrals to the ICC for prosecutions in the Philippines the government announced that they were leaving uh, and they left it takes a year to leave and it incidentally does not immunize a country from prosecution for um, during the period uh, when they were members of the ICC so it doesn't mean that in principle uh, the crimes committed in the Philippines couldn't still be adjudicated. Um, Israel, Sudan, the US and Russia have all withdrawn their signatures from the treaty and the US role over time bears some attention given that we're now in a unipolar world and the American role is so important. So the last possible day you could sign the treaty creating the ICC was the last day of the century um, and the last day of the Clinton administration, not quite the last day of the Clinton administration, it ended the following January, and the Clinton administration signed it. But you can see from what President Clinton said, he said, we reaffirm our strong support for international accountability and for bringing to justice perpetrators of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. 
We do so as well because we wish to remain engaged in making the ICC an instrument of impartial and effective justice in years to come. Uh, so they were signaling they didn't like they didn't like it, but they were going to remain engaged and essentially punt this question to the next administration. They're going to punt the question to the incoming Bush administration, but they didn't want to forestall the possibility of the U.S. being involved. Um, the Bush administration came in to office, as we all now know, um, uh, a year shortly shortly there, thereafter. Um, we had 9/11. Uh, they had the Bush administration before that had taken no action to uh, move forward with American involvement in the uh, in the ICC. After 9/11 in 2002, uh, we, the Bush administration withdrew America's uh, signature, and and uh, so that was the end of that as far as the ICC was concerned. When the Obama administration came in uh, in 2009. They took a somewhat softer attitude toward this ICC and began to engage with it and cooperate with it in various investigations and have observer status at meetings uh, about it and of some of its organ bodies. But even the Obama administration uh, showed no interest in actually having the US sign, partly for the same reason that um, I'd already mentioned, which was the, U the idea that the US uh, involvement in peacekeeping operations would lead Americans to be vulnerable to prosecution was not something that uh, the administration thought it could sell to American voters. Of course, since then we've had uh, the Trump administration, and as you might surmise, that hasn't produced any change either. The United States will provide no support and recognition to the International Criminal Court. As far as America is concerned, the ICC has no jurisdiction, no legitimacy, and no authority. The ICC claims near universal jurisdiction over the citizens of every country, violating all principles of justice, fairness, and due process. We will never surrender America's sovereignty to an unelected, unaccountable global bureaucracy. So there you have an unsurprising summation of the American attitude and reaffirmation of the idea that international law uh, applied to American citizens is not going to be acceptable. So how should we think about whether the ICC is a good or bad thing? Any, any, any thoughts about that? Anyone think it's a good thing? Good thing. Somebody who thinks it's a good thing. Yeah. First one, if you think it's good. A, a metric would be the number of people who are killed in, inter, in inter, interstate conflict. So you say that it would be whether it's a deterrent or not? Yes. Okay, one metric, would it be a deterrent? Yeah, and what else, anyone else? So you're just saying it, that's the metric, you're not sure whether it's a good or bad thing. Do you think it's a good thing? Why is it, a, somebody who thinks it's a good thing, why is it a good thing? Yes, sir. Um, I think it provides an infrastructure for countries who have gone through particular bad, you know, bad situations, war crimes, uh, genocides, to have access to an institution that is you know, judicial in its form, when otherwise it wouldn't have it. Why? Any, any other thoughts? Anyone else think it's a good thing? Yes, sir. I see one hand here. Thank you. Uh, so I think it's not effective, uh, in fact, but it's a good symbol uh, in the world. It's a good symbol. Yes. What, a symbol of what exactly? Uh, to show the the, the accountability of of uh, those uh, that people can be held accountable for what they do. That dictators or people in, engaged in wars can. There's some chance you might be held accountable. It just it stands for for that idea. So uh, okay, a anyone think it's a bad thing? Press two if you think it's, it's bad. It, the truth is, it's tricky to evaluate. Um, so the small scale might not matter that much um, because you oh know the, God, the, I've the read question this. is not whether it's small but perhaps whether it's scalable and um, there's a literature in political science for which uh, Martha Finnemore and Catherine Sickink are famous where they talk about norm cascades and the idea is that once a norm starts to get established provided a critical number and scholars argue about how many endorse the norm it be, uh, others join up as well and um, interestingly um, on that front, in 2016, when uh, South Africa and Gambia and these others were, were threatening to storm out, there, was a, there were large, a lot of predictions that it was all going to fall apart, 
and oh, um, no, domino that theory. there's going to be a massive African exodus. That didn't happen. Um, so to the extent that uh, you know, uh, they also talk about norm entrepreneurs, people who are trying to, this is the realm of ideas now, about right, our three I words, that norm entrepreneurs are trying to get enough countries to start investing in a process that you then reach this a tipping point where it, it will start to become embedded, it might become scalable, uh, and so on. The, the deterrent effect uh, obviously is very tricky to evaluate um, in the sense that uh, at the level of what lawyers call specific deterrence, that's deterring actual individuals from mm. committing crimes, most people, or uh, this is sort of parallel to the debates about the death penalty in the US, most people who, who murder people uh, are not deterred by the death penalty because the point of murdering someone is a point, first of all, nobody's thinking about being apprehended and um, it's usually seething hatred, passion, et cetera. And so uh, it's not clear it has any specific deterrent effect. Whether it would deter others, um, that's what we call general deterrence, hard to say. I would just point out one thing that um, nobody has really fully thought through about this doctrine, and this is, think about what uh, my earlier discussion of Hirschman in connection to democratic transitions. I said that one of the things that needs to happen for, to get dictators to give up power is that the cost of exit must be low, relatively low. Otherwise, they're going to hang on uh, until the end of time. And so Amnesty, amnesty. I want people to listen to that again because there was this one lecture. I don't know if it was two weeks ago. I think it was two weeks ago. No, it was a week ago because we were talking about South Africa. Um, or was that two weeks? I, I forget. But um, there was a chatter who uh, really disagreed with the idea of giving amnesty to uh, people who've done atrocious things. And uh, this is, Ian Shapiro right now is basically uh, giving the argument as to why amnesty is really effective uh, or why uh, giving amnesty to people who commit these atrocious crimes is a strategy to get them to stop committing these atrocious crimes. Happen for to get dictators to give up power is that the cost of exit must be low, relatively low. Otherwise, they're going to hang on. Uh, until the end of time. And so, for instance, Idi Amin um, got to live out his life, ironically, in Libya uh, after he was forced out of power. He had, an, he had a place where he could go, uh, and he was not prosecuted uh, for anything. Gaddafi, on the other hand, was referred to the ICC. He was, he was killed in, in the, before he was ever brought to trial. But so, so if, you, if you're thinking about amnesty, you know, amnesty uh, as part of a negotiated settlement for a conflict, uh, how that would square with this doctrine is a difficult thing to, to think through, and, and there are obviously trade-offs there. So it's, it's, not, it's, not obvious, uh, it's not obvious how we should think about this doctrine, but it, it, is, it is alive, it, is, as it sort of wobbled into existence, it, it is subject to all these criticisms. It's, Bribes work if you want immediate results worth it IMO. Well, what we are bribing them through amnesty is you're not going to get prosecuted. You're going to live out your life. You're going to uh, you're going to be exiled, but you're going to be living in another country or going to have your own island and you're not going to have any trouble. Just like, please step down. Stop using your military to kill your own people. OK, just just stop. OK, and if you stop, we, we won't pursue anything. That's the logic of amnesty. That is really a bribe. Uh, concessions, bribes. Mm. Would it be concessions? Uh, I, I guess it would be concessions. We're trying to negotiate some sort of a deal. We have some leverage or we have something that they want that they see is effective. Because here's the thing. Is that the, the alternative to amnesty uh, or like them continuing to do so is... Uh, they're going to get intervened, okay? They're going to get stopped or they're going to get prosecuted. So what is like the best, what, what is better than continuing and then eventually getting prosecuted? Well, it's living out your life and not getting prosecuted. So we provide them an alternative that is better than what they would be doing if we didn't give them animacy in exchange for them stopping their atrocities. Politics is about my personal moral catharsis. Incentives are for libs. Ah, ah, ah. It's um, 
inequitably applied. Uh, the US in particular has been rather hypocritical in the way that it's used the doctrine that it won't allow itself to be subjected to. But the norm entrepreneurs would argue, you know, this is, this is the way that norms gradually get established and embedded in the international oh, hell order. Yeah. And so norm the, the goal should be to improve it and address its defects rather than say that it's just illegitimate uh, way in which uh, some countries beat up others. Let's turn to the responsibility to protect, which is in some ways a much more ambitious rewriting of the international rules. Anyone know what that is? It's the Hague. Pardon? No, it's not. Nope. Good, reasonable guess, yeah. Is it actually? Well, it's actually, it's the NATO bombing of Kosovo in 1999. And the NATO, NATO bombing of Kosovo in 1999 came after many years of civil war uh, that had basically broken out with the collapse of the, so, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia had come to pieces. And um, there was ethnic cleansing of Albanian Muslim Kosovars uh, at the hands of Serbian militias going on. And the, NATO alliance, notice the NATO alliance, took a decision to intervene. Here's President Clinton talking about it. The Kosovars have been victims of terrible atrocities. Their only hope was that the world would not turn away in the face of ethnic cleansing and killing, that the world would take a stand. We did for 78 days. Because we did, the Kosovars will go home. To achieve our aims as an alliance, 19 democratic nations with 780 million people working together in the first sustained military operation in NATO's history. The alliance did stay together. It is now stronger and more united than ever. And I thank my fellow leaders in the alliance for their fidelity and their fortitude. In the past four months, we have seen some of the worst inhumanity in our lifetime. But we've also seen the bravery of our troops, the resolve of our democracy, the decency of our people, and the courage and determination of the people of Kosovo. We now have a moment of hope, thanks to all those qualities. And we have to finish the job and build the peace. So what had happened here was that um, th this ongoing civil war had resulted in uh, many human rights violations on all sides. Um, but this was the point at which, when there was this imminent ethnic cleansing in Kosovo, that, the, that NATO decided to intervene in mid-1999. And um, one thing about this intervention was that it, it was widely judged to have succeeded. That is to say, the ethnic cleansing ended um, and uh, didn't, didn't reinitiate, even though there were, there were no uh, NATO troops on the ground in, in uh, Kosovo. There were European Union troops massing on the border, uh, some, but they never actually went in. It was very unusual for, for two reasons. Um, one was that this was a NATO operation, and it was in violation of the NATO charter. We've talked about NATO. You know that Article 5 authorizes NATO members uh, to use force and indeed to turn to one another to use force uh, if any one of them was attacked. But no NATO member was threatened. Uh, during Kos the Kosovo and the Yugos former Yugoslavia civil war. There was no threat to any member of NATO. So this was, not, uh, a, this was not a legitimate activity for NATO as a defensive alliance to have been engaged in. It was also not authorized by the Security Council. Um, why was it not authorized by the Security Council? Because the Russians uh, were basically on the Serbian, sympathetic to the Serbian side in this conflict, and the, clearly the Russians and almost certainly the Chinese would have vetoed any attempt to get authorization for NATO to get involved in this conflict. So there was no Security Council authorization, uh, and it was not uh, anything that one could legitimately say was part and parcel of um, NATO's, NATO's mandate to protect the member states. They just did it. They simply did it. Now, one might say, uh, what were Clinton's motives? And some have said his motives were to divert attention from Monica Lewinsky. Um, uh, Christopher Hitchens, among others, claimed that. But um, even uh, setting Monica Lewinsky aside, uh, I, I think part of Clinton's motivation surely was to redeem himself. He had taken so much criticism after Rwanda for the US's failure to act in the Rwandan controversy. And here he was on the verge of leaving the presidency. This is 
summer of 1999, uh, and he, um, he thought, this is my moment to redeem myself and to show that the US will, in fact, act. And indeed, he enunciated what some uh, of his hiographers called the Clinton Doctrine. He said here, uh, shortly after that um, press conference I showed you, he said, never forget, if we can do this here, and if we can say to people of the world, whether you live in Africa or Central Europe or any other place, if somebody comes after innocent civilians and tries to kill them en masse because of their race, their ethnic background, or their religion, and it is within our power to stop it, we will stop it. Right? Very different than the stance he took um, over Rwanda. And the Secretary General of the UN was Kofi Annan, now the Ghanaian uh, Secretary General, now deceased. Uh, he got behind this. He said, if humanitarian intervention is indeed an unacceptable assault on sovereignty, how should we respond to a Rwanda, to a Srebrenica, to gross and systematic violations that affect every precept of our common humanity? And his answer was, the sovereignty of states must no longer be used as a shield for gross violations of human rights. This okay. Pause. Why? Because this is a big deal. This is the person who is in charge, like the head of the United Nations, saying to the UN Charter and to, I don't know how many decades of the norm being sovereignty protects a lot of things, basically taking a shit on sovereignty, saying that the sovereignty of states must no longer be used as a shield for gross violations of human rights. This is a pretty big deal, a pretty big signal to a lot of countries and the governments, and to a lot of people, especially norm entrepreneurs, who are like, this is going to be a start, or this is going to be a start to some big changes in the international community and international law, and the dynamics of international relations. Must no longer be used as a shield for gross violations of human rights. This is a dramatic statement uh, in, in strong tension, to put it mildly, with the Charter of the UN. But the question becomes, how can you do that? How does one do that, particularly uh, given a world of nation states that, uh, whose sovereignty is protected? And so there was a lot of handling and wrestling with this problem. And interestingly, um, the, 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 in the, the, um, the Prime Minister of Sweden took it upon himself uh, to, to appoint a commission on Kosovo, which was established in August of 1999. And the commission reported with the following statement. It said, the commission concludes that the NATO military intervention was illegal but legitimate. <laughs> it was illegal but legitimate. It was illegal because it did not receive prior approval from the Security Council. However, the Commission considers that the intervention was justified because all diplomatic avenues had been exhausted and because the intervention had the effect of liberating the majority population of Kosovo from a long period of oppression under Serbian rule. Illegal but legitimate. What can... Basically saying that it didn't follow the rules, but it was the right thing to do. What does that mean? What do we, can we say something is, is illegal? Yes, you need the microphone. We, we need, we'll, we'll need a dissertation here. Yeah. Wait, wait a second, get the microphone. They'll never hear you otherwise, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like it's um, the international community trying to reconcile the contradiction of, that you just put, national sovereignty, but it's sometime intervention good. Um, this seems like you can't have war or the idea of armed intervention that still respects national sovereignty. Um, and so it seems like this is just a halfway return to the pre like World War II consensus of, well, national sovereignty is a given. So it's, it's, it certainly is a different conception of national sovereignty, but you're saying it's illegal but legitimate. We can say we, we can violate international law when it's legitimate for us to do so. But what legitimates the action? How is it legitimate? What makes it legitimate? Um, perhaps thinking about the ideas, interest institutions, uh, it's a matter more of interests and especially power interests than institutions in itself. Dan, these Yale students. One more at the back, yeah. 
Uh, okay. Yes, sir. We'll take two more. You and then you. Yeah. I would just say R2P trumps the international order. Say that again. R2P trumps the international order. No, this is in 1999, my dude. R2P didn't come up until 2005 at the World Summit. Well, we, we don't yet have a doctrine of R2P at this time, right? So we'll, Yikes, these we'll Yale students. But, yeah. Okay, gentleman at the back, the last one, yeah. The, uh, the ends that justify the means. The ends justify the means. So you, another way of, of saying that and perhaps capturing what some others were saying is perhaps sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission, <laughs> right? Sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness. If you know some horrific thing is about to happen that you can stop, and you also know that if you ask for permission it's going to be denied, maybe you better just do it, right? Maybe you better just do it. And so, uh, th that, you know, and that moral philosophers have, have debated this principle, uh, or maybe it's a pragmatic judgment and not a principle, but there's a principle behind it, presumably, which is that some things are so egregiously bad and so frightening that, uh, you know, if, if the legal order will not permit it, uh, it's too bad at some level for the legal order. And so this was, I think, the thinking behind uh, this idea of illegal but legitimate. But of course, how do you turn a norm like that, how do you turn a, a dictum like that into a norm, much less a rule? How can you institutionalize the idea of that it's okay to ask for forgiveness rather than permission? Not obvious how you can do that, because the, the whole idea is you're acting against the existing institutions because you've concluded that it's the right thing to do. So how might one institutionalize that? And it's important to say that not everybody agreed. Not everybody agreed. We say the international community this, the international community that. The international community didn't agree. Not everyone thought that Kosovo should become a precedent, especially in the global south. The logic was seen as a potential smokescreen for major powers to pursue their own agendas within months. The G77, this is a large number of, de of developing world countries, condemned the so-called humanitarian intervention. South Africa and India amplified this criticism. Nelson Mandela, who had recently stepped down uh, as South African president, said when two nations, he wasn't fooled by the idea that it was a large coalition, basically the US and Britain, take it upon themselves to police the world without getting authorization from the UN, we must condemn that because it can lead to another world war. The South African government, reflecting the positions of the non-aligned movement and the OAU, declared unilateral intervention, no matter how noble, the pretext is not acceptable. India called the Kosovo operation a flagrant violation of all international norms against the provisions of the UN Charter and seen as, and, and it saw it as a direct and unprovoked aggression. Um, so, uh, as I said, there wasn't consensus about this by any means across the global south, and particularly because this was a NATO operation led by the US. Um, so that led to the, was followed by, I shouldn't say led, it didn't, wasn't caused, but it was followed by a, an international commission on intervention in state sovereignty that was convened in London, again with input from the UN and various NGOs, and it was chaired by uh, Gareth Evans, a former um, Australian Prime Minister, uh, Mohamed Sanoun, who was an Algerian diplomat and a major player in it, was the Canadian academic and sometime not very successful Canadian politician, Michael Ignatieff. And they came up with this idea of the responsibility to protect. And um, we'll talk in some depth about it in a minute, but I want to note, first of all, that the, the concept of the responsibility to protect is, is, an imp is as important for what it doesn't say as for what it does say. It doesn't say that there's any right. Uh, it talks about a responsibility. Uh, it doesn't say that there's a right. The responsibility here is not uh, there's not a responsibility on the UN or on the Security Council. The responsibility in the phrase responsibility to reflect refers to governments. Governments have a responsibility to protect this, that not only their citizens but people living within their territories. Um, and uh, it doesn't talk about an obligation to intervene. Even though it suggests there's some kind of imperative for action, it doesn't say when you have certain kinds of rights violation, there's an obligation to intervene. I'll say of this more later. Um, again, the, yeah, there's the, definitely a lot more in to the global south, this was not welcomed. And the African Union um, said, well, if the UN is going to start taking upon itself to authorize intervening in other countries, so are we. And so the African Union 
uh, asserted the right to intervene in a member state, that's pretty much, I think there's 50 members of the African Union, almost every African country, pursuant to a decision by the Assembly in grave circumstances, namely war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. And notice that there's no mention of the Security Council, despite the fact that the UN Charter reserves to the Security Council um, a monopoly on declaring non-defensive use of force. So if, essentially the African Union is saying, well, uh, if, you know, if the Security Council or NATO or other groups are going to start intervening in countries, then so are we. And so the, the stability envisaged in the, in the NATO Charter could be, uh, threat, seem to be threatened. In 2005, the UN General Assembly debated this so-called uh, World Summit Outcome document and adopted it, behaving now as a kind of legislature. That is to say, uh, uh, remember what I said at the beginning of the lecture, that the, that the UN is a creature of a treaty. It is the, general, the General Assembly is not a legislature. But in, in, in any case, they adopted this provision. And they said, each individual state that country has the responsibility to protect its populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. Uh, these all have complex legal definitions which people wrangle over. This responsibility entails the prevention of such crimes, including their incitement, through appropriate and necessary means. We, this is the UN General Assembly, accept that responsibility and will act within accordance of it. We are prepared to take collective action in a timely and decisive manner through the Security Council on a case-by-case -case basis and in cooperation with relevant regional organizations as appropriate, should peaceful means be inadequate and national authorities manifestly fail to protect their populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. So here you have the UN General Assembly taking it upon itself to say there's, there's a responsibility to protect, it falls on governments, and if they don't uh, live up to that responsibility, the Security Council can authorize regional organizations and other players to intervene. That's hugely important because UN, you know, the UN does not really have much of an army, uh, and UN peacekeepers traditionally have only gone into conflicts once, once there's uh, peace established, we, as we saw at the very beginning with the Rwanda picture, they did not go into actually to get involved in peacemaking, but only in peacekeeping. Um, so some, some things to think about with responsibility to protect. First of all, uh, unlike the ICC, it's binding on signatories and non-signatories alike. So they've declared unilaterally that this doctrine is binding on all governments. Um, they restricted it to these four major categories of crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing, even though the, the Evans Sanun Commission had wanted a much more expansive uh, set of things to protect against, but the thinking was that uh, in order to get uh, a majority to accept it, it would have to remain focused on the most egregious, the most egregious uh, violations. Um, the domestic focus here seems and indeed does contradict the UN Charter's focus on international peace and security because now, in, in effect, what R2P has said is that it is legitimate for the international community uh, as represented by the United Nations and authorized by the Security Council to intervene in the domestic affairs of a country uh, if, if, if it's triggered by um, one of those genocide crimes against humanity, war crimes, or ethnic cleansing. Another feature of it that's worth noting, and this again uh, goes to my earlier observation that there's no right to demand intervention. It's not binding on the Security Council to intervene. As I said, it gives wide latitude as to when the Security Council will be intervening because it's, it intervenes on a case-by-case -case basis. So the, the, the Security Council may intervene, but there's no, nothing in this doctrine which says the Security Council must intervene in any particular conflict. Uh, and that will turn out to be important. Um, the non-aligned movement didn't like it. Uh, and the non-aligned movement uh, is a group of mostly middle-income countries around the world. So how should we think about this doctrine? This is obviously, you know, uh, as I said, both the ICC and um, and the responsibility to protect are starting to rewrite the international architecture of um, intervention. But this is a much more ambitious 
rewriting than the ICC, and we're now not talking about prosecuting a few individual perpetrators, we're actually talking about intervening in countries during ongoing conflicts um, to make peace and uh, stop gross human rights violations. Just a good, good move? Who, who thinks it's a good move? Somebody want to? I do. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma More norm setting? So say, say a little bit more about the norm setting. I don't know much more, but <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it would be a good norm to have for humanity. Okay, it's certainly a norm. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, it seems like it's gone beyond a norm now. It's right. It's, it's just really changing international institutions, right? Uh, okay. If somebody is going to be saying should, or if they're going to be saying this is a good norm, always follow up with this. Why? Because there's always a reason to a should. If there's no reason to a should, if somebody is just saying, oh, this should be the case, and be like, okay, why? And they're like, I don't fucking know. It just should be. And it's like, okay, there is obviously a reason. They just don't know it. But it's really important to ask that question, to get that follow-up to the should, to the normative questions, or to the normative statements. Um, we've, we now have, uh, we have the Security Council in a position to actually intervene. This is so, it, it is, if you like, a common law, by, by which I mean a gradual, um, but nonetheless decisive rewriting of the rules uh, governing UN intervention within the affairs of governments. Doesn't mean it's good or bad, but it, it's very extensive. Any other? Yes, sir. Wait, wait a second. I think it's highly contradictory, and any country can, depending on its own like, utility, can decide whether to consider it as a genocide or not. No, that is not true, because it has to be authorized by the United Nations Security Council. And I can give two examples. Uh, U U.S. was highly, um, highly, highly cr criticizing the war affairs in Syria, while in Ukraine, when the radicals just born into um, the like opera house in Odessa, it was kind of okay because... So there may be disagreement as to whether the conditions prevail or not, uh, at no. least in some cases. I mean, uh, I think it can be still biased, and depending on the... It could be manipulated. Yes. It could be manipulated, but any doctrine can be manipulated, just to play devil's advocate to your comment for a minute. Go, let's go back to Rwanda in 1994. The fact is, no one had any doubt in Rwanda in 1994 that genocide was going on. It was, it was uh, you know, you can go back now through the, through the uh, archives and, and it's perfectly plain that all the major powers knew that genocide was imminent and then it was, that it was starting and then it went on for many months. Now they might not have been able to stop it. Uh, it might not have been successful, but the, uh, the book I put on the syllabus, I think the, the, the probably the, the best book on this, certainly the estimates are that of the 800,000 to a million people killed, had there been intervention, at least 200,000 uh, people could have been saved. So you could say, well, still be 600,000 killed, yes, but 200,000 people is not a trivial number of people, right, e to save, even if that's double what really could have been, you know, it still would have been. So that would be, that, you know, uh, there might be cases where it's manipulable, there might be cases where, um, where uh, it's unclear, where it's disputed, and we'll talk about one of those cases in a few classes, uh, three classes, from today. Um, so uh, yeah, any, any other thoughts about whether this is a good way for international law of intervention to evolve? Yeah. Within the constraint of there being a veto, it's an establishment of some kind of world government as a legitimate user of force. And I would support that. You like the idea that there's a veto? <laughs> no, I like the idea that there's a legitimate the use of force government. in this instance. Okay. But it does basically yeah. change the Charter of the United Nations. So but it has a constraint still that there is a veto, but that is there's a veto in the Security accept. Council. Yeah, the, the permanent members they're now permanent and non-permanent members of the Security Council, but the original five still have a veto. Um, okay, so um, anyone think it's a bad idea? I right, press two if you think it's a bad idea. We'll defer judgment of that question a, a little while. So here were some early tests of this doctrine. This is actually before the outcome oh, no. had been adopted by the General Assembly in Sudan. Um, 
the Security Council called for an arms embargo and referred to the idea, it was still being debated then. Um, in Kenya in 2006, after the election, there was an eruption of ethnic violence, 800 people were killed, um, more than a quarter of a million were displaced, and the French called for a responsibility to protect action to intervene. Uh, Kofi Annan headed it off, basically, um, by uh, going there and negotiating a, a settlement. And some argued that it was the threat of the possibility of intervention that actually uh, helped him uh, negotiate or mediate the conflict in a way that headed off the um, violence or, or damped it down. In Guinea in 2008, um, there was a, an attempted coup. The leader, Kamara's troops, rioted against demonstrators. And by then, it was Ban Ki-moon, who was Secretary General. He set up an inquiry and raised the possibility of crimes against humanity and started again talking about R2P. Um, the US and EU suspended assistance, but it, be it became moot after Kamara fled the country. And so again, they were on the verge of, um, on the verge of, of intervening. Um, on, the, on the grounds that there were gross human rights violations going on, uh, but then they actually did it. And then in uh, 2011, the, I mentioned to you earlier that the, the Security Council, unanimously including the US, referred Gaddafi to the ICC um, for prosecution. But in the course of that referral, they talked about the responsibility to protect uh, uh, being triggered possibly in Libya. This was in February of 2011. Uh, they were hinting uh, already that they might be, uh, uh, this is, this is the, following the outbreak of the Arab Spring, we've had, um, we've had eruptions in, in, in uh, Tunisia and in Egypt and now uh, in, in Libya. Civil war breaks out and uh, there, was a, a, there were claims, disputed claims about uh, imminent uh, slaughter in Benghazi, um, much disputed, and we'll talk about the disputes later. In any event, uh, the, they referred Gaddafi to um, the ICC, and they talked about the responsibility to protect and uh, use that to impose an arms embargo on the country and um, various other sanctions. The first real test of R2P came the following month uh, when the Security Council adopted UN Resolution 1973 authorizing uh, intervention in the Libyan conflict. And we'll return to that uh, on October 24th, and we'll then think about, at the end of the, uh, that examination, we'll see what we think about the future prospects for the doctrine of responsibility to protect. But first, we need to attend to the global war on terror, which fundamentally changed the international legal and political landscape in ways that affected the prospects for doctrines like the responsibility to protect. And we'll do All right, uh, do you guys want some spoilers to what happens after Libya and responsibility to protect? Um, tell me now because I'm opening some stuff up and you want spoilers? Okay. I want to see if I have anything. Peacekeeping, responsibility to protect, turns 10, has no. Nope. Okay, I don't, but I have to Google it. Okay. Uh, that's not how you spell Libya. <laughs> <laughs> Is the responsibility to protect dead? The view from Libya. This is... This is what happens. Libya is a complete fucking disaster. And there is article after article after article suggesting the question, is R2P dead? Is it done for? Is it a complete failure? Is it just out? Irrelevant. Completely. Dead, dying, or thriving? What is going on after Libya? And then some are like, no, man, Libya is the exception. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of material about responsibility to protect that comes after Libya. Some believe that 
It is dying because of Libya. Some believe, no, this is a part of the process. This is the norm of responsibility to protect cascading. It fails. It succeeds. We try it again. We don't try it again. But one thing is for sure. Responsibility to protect is still present in the language that world leaders use on speeches or within the United Nations Security Council or when trying to refer to other conflicts. We see an increase over the years of the word responsibility being used by world leaders. And that is a sign that responsibility to protect is still being referred to. And when it's being referred to, it's still relevant. And that is the spoiler. So that's it for today's lecture, the International Criminal Court and responsibility to protect. I just want to take a look at my message really quickly. Okay. Nothing that, that really concerns me. What do I want to do with my time nowadays? Let me check out some polyclip stuff. What do you think about the lecture? I'm always going to enjoy it, by the way. Okay, there's, there's no need to go question what I think about the lecture. I thought... Shapiro could have elaborated more on responsibility to protect. So in particular, responsibility to protect is known to have three pillars. Uh, Ian Shapiro kind of referred to two, or like you could, some people believe that there's two, but I think it's really good to distinguish that there are three. Okay? There are three norms to the larger norm that is responsibility to protect. The first norm is states, countries, governments have the responsibility to protect their own population. That's pillar number one. Pillar number two is that states, governments, govern, uh, countries have the responsibility to help other states achieve pillar number one. A, there's the responsibility to provide assistance. Pillar number three is when we get to intervention. Countries, states, and governments have the responsibility to intervene in other countries when those countries fail in achieving pillar number one and when assistance to that country, pillar number two, is not and viable option. So those are the three pillars to responsibility to protect. Notice that one, the, only one of the pillars out of the three actually involve military intervention. And the reason why they're ordered that way is because, well, if you got pillar number one and pillar number two, you don't need pillar number three. Pillar number one is countries Get your shit together. Pillar number two is, yo, provide some assistance, cooperate, diplomacy, share some resources. And then pillar number three is the means of last resort, military intervention. So when you're going to be uh, talking to people about responsibility to protect, and they're really hung up about military intervention and sovereignty and how the United States fucks up and they shouldn't do so. Remember, remember that responsibility to protect goes beyond military intervention. You'll catch again on VOD or YouTube. Sorry, you had to take a call for family. Yo, that sucked him. Never. You always tell me this, okay? You always say this, but don't ever say sorry for leaving stream in order to do something. 
dude that's uh, that's definitely more important and you know that there's gonna be a vod it's gonna be on twitch it's gonna be on youtube and uh, anybody could watch it at any time there's there's no uh i guess what is it there's no immediacy there's no urgency in watching this live or watching this in real time or watching this as soon as possible my sister is having dental issues my support uh, she's in germany and hasn't been vaccinated yet so it's concerning for her to go to a dentist yikes tell her to be safe uh cat i think there are a bunch of complicated ethical problems about r2p that never got addressed except when alluding to objections from the non-aligned movement 100 percent, i agree there is a rigorous debate on r2p and unfortunately i've tried to had to have this debate on Twitch, it's not good. So let me try to give you like um, a really short TLDR of what are the huge major objections to R2P. A lot of the smaller countries, the weaker countries, and Ian Shapiro noted the G77, India, um, South Africa. The G77 is a group of 77 countries juxtaposed to the G20. The G20 being uh, 19 countries along plus the EU. They're like the big countries, okay? You hear about uh, the G7, the G20. The G77 is the group of 77 countries that are like, yo, if you're going to have the G7 and the G20, well, we're going to have a group of 77 countries. The weaker countries, something like that. The weaker countries typically argue that Responsibility to protect is a tool that powerful countries can use and abuse in order to flex their uh, influence militarily to other countries. We already heard in the, in the lecture that there is an issue in countries defining and being in control of what they consider to be a legitimate genocide, ethnic cleansing, war crime, crime against humanity, and what is not legitimate. This brings a huge conflict of interest ethical problem. That a lot of smaller countries are really fearful about the larger countries using. Here is the counter to that. And this is what I would argue. Responsibility to protect, along with the United Nations Security Council, assures that no country is able to unilaterally use responsibility to protect for an intervention. There are a couple of requirements necessary in order for responsibility to protect and for the United Nations Security Council to allow it to be invoked. One of them is there needs to be a coalition of countries. The reason why there needs to be a coalition is because when you have a group of countries being there, you have a group of countries giving each other checks. It's a form of checks and balances. That way, you don't have one country or one country's military calling all the shots or uh, them determining what is the aftermath to a peace operation or to an intervention. And at the very end of the day, even though the United Nations Security Council is made up of countries, it's a group of countries, and five of them have veto power. And when you have five countries that have veto power, and they all agree that there's going to be something, or at least abstain, if they all agree that there is something going on, then that is in itself a demonstration that it is quite legitimate to invoke responsibility to protect. Now, there are other ethical issues when it comes to responsibility to protect, especially when it comes to the debate on sovereignty, whether or not we respect it, whether or not it is a it should be considered a protection to countries committing these kinds of crimes. Should we allow these things? Should we not allow these things? Uh, currently, 
But because of how recent Responsibility to Protect, note that this was in 2005. And while 2005 to you and me uh, as human beings may be really, really short time, um, really, really like not long ago, or actually no, excuse me, it's a really long time ago. Okay, like in 2005, what was I? I was, I was eight years old. I mean, that's a, that's a long time for me. It's a really short time when it comes to, de to the development of international law. Especially when it comes to the development of norms. Norms take a lot longer to develop. And thus, we are, in a way, witnessing or living in the creation or uh, the, the changing dynamics of international law. Especially, I think... What's going to be huge in like maybe a, a couple of years is how we are going to be using the language of responsibility to protect to address the Uyghur genocide in China. That is going to be something that uh, I, I kind of look forward. No, I don't look forward to it at all because it's incredibly dangerous. There are dangerous implications. Having one of the P5 members, a state in, who holds nuclear, who has a nuclear arsenal, and suggest that uh, there is a genocide going on there. And if there is a genocide going on there, how does that relate to responsibility to protect? And how does that relate to the first, second, and third pillar of responsibility to protect? And if it continues to get recognized and we continue to see that the, the Chinese state is not going to be fulfilling its responsibility in protecting that kind of, to be, to be protecting the Uyghur population, then what does that mean when it comes to intervention? And how the fuck do we militarily intervene in China? This no longer becomes an ethical issue, it also becomes a practical issue. Because China is second largest GDP in the world, has a strong military, even though it's nothing in comparison to the United States military, a clash between the two will surely be very deadly. I'm not looking forward to it, but it's interesting, but I'm not looking forward to it. Uh, thank you, will do. I think it's just the way I talk. You asked what we thought of the lecture, but I couldn't uh, place full attention on it. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's that totally makes sense. Diet suck them. I got you. I got you. Um, I keep on getting notifications. Let me see. Okay. It is nothing. It's just the the typical Discord notification. Um. Though, do, 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 guess what I want to do? I have a huge backlog in poly clips so i'm gonna try to work on that for a bit until uh 12 o'clock hits so let's see what we can do you was awake cooking dinner but i agree with everything chow said <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank, thank you yeah, what a crazy week can i just can i get a break okay this I, was it this month that I got the IRI shit? Was it this month that I got exposed as polyclips? Or was that last month? I could just let me let me just find out. Uh, that that is not. It was April. This this month needs to stop. Okay. It needs to end. It was last month? Was it last? This, I, I can't. Uh, why do I keep hiding Polyclips videos? Why do I keep hiding them? Oh, you mean, uh, why do I have some videos in private? Private video. Because there's a certain person on these videos that I see as problematic. And I have made the decision to not include them in those videos. 
So what I will be doing is I will be... Uh, I have them all downloaded, so I could just edit their clips out, and I will republish them. That's what's going to happen. It is unfortunate that private videos uh, have to... We're going to be losing some views. We're going to be losing some hours, maybe. Uh, it's going to stall, too. This is, dude, running a clips channel is is super problematic especially because it's in relation to my brand okay i am now polyclips i need to get that through my head i need to realize that i cannot separate senpai chow and polyclips we are now one in the same polyclips is no longer a, a person polyclips is a project it's a project of senpai chow and there's going to be a lot of problems because I have to say things. I have to. I still want to continue my brand. I still want to have opinions. I still want to have arguments. I still want to have debates. I still want to, um, like be con contentiously with a lot of people. But the thing about poly thing about politics is that you have people on the left, you have people on the right, you have people in the middle, and I'm going to be disagreeing with a lot of people. It just sucks. Uh. This actually just might be a demonstration that an idea like this is just, it's not worth it. <laughs> now you want to figure out who the forbidden person is. Well, you kind of can't. Maybe you can. Who the fuck knows? It's Kurt. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> Good fucking luck. Okay, I, I have, um, dude, look at all these filters. Temp. I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six days of poly clips that I haven't done because I've been so busy recently. Damn. Uh, this sucks. And, I need, and let me change my stream title to... I, I need to go to just chatting. And... Uh, adding is two Ts. And then what? What is thy title? Cracking polyclips. Cracking polyclips. Someone did once tell me that women don't have buttholes until they're married. That's true. That's why I'm not married. I prefer it this way. Look at the title here. Now we know. Now we know. Excited for this to be on Polyclips. I have to include this. I have to include this. Uh, I was in the middle of this. Where did I stop? I think I stopped there. Hold on a second. Let me do something. There. That's a lot better. I think you guys know who's the problematic person. <laughs> it was pretty obvious. You wish I was around more to make decent clips. Just being gone, I would have fun with this. Dude, you could you could still do it. I, I'm not go I'm not going away. But uh, what does infrared have to say? And this is what like Dylan Burns viewers think of. Okay, drama drama clip. Mark Monkey, what do you got for me? God, I should find that thing. Hang on a second. Oh, fine. That's a good one. All right. That's what you get, Mark Monkey. So racist. They're so incredibly racist. And like my sister just constantly has to like check them because they'll just say like little slick stuff like, oh, what's your favorite Medea? Oh my God. Oh my God. Please. Please do not this this clip. Please. So racist. They're so incredibly racist. And like my sister just say constantly it. has to like check them because they'll just say like little okay. slick stuff like, Oh, like, what's your favorite? What are you, you going to say? What are you going to say? Who is this? Whose stream is this? This is Fanatics. All right, Fanatic, I trust you. Dia movie, like, like weird things like that. I was good at the children. It is like, what? Okay, I don't know. Like, oh, what do you want for lunch today? You don't have to be chicken, ha ha. Like, stuff like that. Jesus. Which is like, 
we laugh about it. It's just like, I don't, keep on, she's talking to five year olds. It's so fucked up. But, um, black versus white is people, good hearted people against racism. So like never lose sight of that. Well, I just got to speak up there. Uh, no black person is racist and black men don't cheat. So I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's my that's the second one. What's that second one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? We all Dude, know. Dude, is, isn't this Trihex? Trihex is actually a follower of mine. I hate him. For sure. <laughs> Look, I think the 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 somehow I'm gonna keep that. Somehow Trihex is a follower of Senpai Chat. I don't know when that happened. Your creator. What did I just say? I'm not doing anything in VR right now. I'm moving like my thing like this. I'm not doing actually anything. I'm just trying to create a clip to pretend that I'm doing VR shit. That's it. it, it this is for the video that you're seeing on screen right now, basically. I want for the E uh, to show, like, basically, like, uh, yeah. Oh, that's cute. It would be irrelevant reacting to the self, reacting to Mike, reacting to the self, reacting to Bo. Uh, reacting to, oh, to my, my god. And now we add a new layer of meta where it's me reacting to a red event, reacting to the self, reacting to, uh, to Mike Rampier, reacting to the self, reacting to the video. Holy Why shit. is React Does content anyone like this? To cover my stream so we can, like, you know, continue. You got it. Your wish is my command. What is he doing? Oh my god, what happened? Why does he look like- what did he do? Dude, I wanna- I wanna see... Geek's hair in front of him. He's stoned? Why does he look stoned? He looks terrible. This man looks like a troll under the bridge. This man looks like right here. He looks like a hobo. And he looks like he's about to eat your children. He will eventually stream. You know you can stream yourself sleeping. You can also stream yourself eating. Hmm. But can you stream yourself showering? Now French people don't shower. And they also don't talk when they stream. Interact! All right, Polar, what do you got? Professor. Killer example, the Mondragon okay. Federation of Co-ops exists under a capitalist framework. Could I finish or do you need to tell me about oh, the Mondragon damn. Corporation? I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no, sure <laughs> what a low kid. Oh my God. Can we get a replay on that? <laughs> oh my God. I'm so disappointed in you, Polar. Oh my god! What a dunk! Oh, can we get a replay? Can we get a sports replay? A highlight reel? Hot damn! Are gonna be outnumbered, unfortunately. In this, in this situation. Look, it's right so, when Senpai so, Chow. Uh, okay, I just want to understand your perspective here, Derm. Um, are, are you saying that the... Why is the clip named Destiny? <laughs> the Vice article was right. Oh, you read that? I read that this morning. <laughs> oh, that was funny. That's that's how you know. All right, I'm. We're on the right track here. Which politics? We're on the right track when you got people like Vice writing articles about us. All right, we're moving up. We're moving up. Are gonna be outnumbered, unfortunately. In this, this name in this situation. So, so, uh, okay. I, I just want to understand your perspective here, Derm. Um, are you, are you saying that the that in recent years the perspective has changed? Um. Oh, one second. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Destiny. That's awfully kind of you. Oh my God! It's just a shout out. Fuck off. Society. Now let's put these people, these other person, in for two years. You know, but. You know, are we now going to start voting, elect voting in and voting out? These officers? It's a prime Kai's panel. This is probably 1 a.m. in the morning. 
average block of employees. And then you got people from Australia and Europe, and it's like, to them, it's like maybe six o'clock in the morning. Or community, um, members of the community who are working towards. Dude, I could barely hear you. Why was that clipped? Even biosecurity. Um, and I have really interesting takes that should keep me here. Okay. Alright, smug plug. Give me your knees and beg. Beg Katarana. Give you round, one more round. One more round. Why should her, that woman, this queen of physicists, not uh, spare you? Well, it's because I actually just want to talk to this you know? and I can't hear unlike them. Unlike some of these other panelists that are just gonna crawl. I'm sorry, Prime. Your community needs to put better. Oh. Oh, okay. Timey. Timey. What is with the fucking... The upskirts? Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's going to the video game. That's going to the video game. <laughs> oh my god. Let's watch that again. Oh. Oh, okay. What is a phase? <laughs> what illusory wall was that? It's Dark Souls. Uh, if you want to understand upskirts, then you need to think about why certain people get 10k views and why I have 7 right. You can't tell me I have my view count invisible right now i don't see my view count I mean, you, you, you want to see a, up pants okay people are talking about upskirts but you want to see up pants wait a second i'm not wearing socks how disgusting are my feet okay you want to see up pants now, now you get to see up my pants you enjoy it huh am i getting 10k views now hot tub chow when Actually, uh, maybe in a couple months. <laughs> Who is that? You like Dark Souls? That's Saimi. Oh my god. Are you guys, like, finding, discovering new streamers on Twitch politics through Polyclips? Do you know that Twitch politics streamers are the lifeblood of Polyclips? And without their content, Polyclips is literally nothing. And I have a lot of thanks for them. And the best way to support Polyclips is by supporting the Twitch politics streamer who actually contributes to Polyclips. So please go check out these wonderful streamers of Polyclips. And the one that you just saw was Saimi. Uh, let's see if I could remember. As I could just, what am I doing? I just see the name right there. Boom. Boom. Go check me out. Hey, nerd. You missed the nerd session. All right. I like the, I like the sure. music. Ba, ba, ba. Beats. I haven't oh, listened to stream beats in a while. First time ever in my chat. That was a transition. I want to. I want to look chat? at that again. Wait, I feel like that's so it's so unfinished here. No, it's not. It's it's is it ratio? No, it's not. It's kind of ratioed. Is this a bait? Three minutes. Doing your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Doing... <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, we've been playing games. Oh. Hot damn. I had one XP for one frame there. That was fucking worth happened? it. What just happened? What's happened? Oh. Oh my I had God. one XP for one what frame there. That was fucking worth it. Win. Oh, Tina got five clips. When John Marcus tells nice. you to come, you better come. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> right, like, has nobody figured out that instead of doing comrade, you could do comrade? 
for any of the leftist Coomer streamers. Has anybody done this? Am I just an entrepreneur? Out. Hello everybody, I hope you're all well. So a couple of videos ago, I asked you guys if you wanted to see an entire video about 2010. Of course it's a trans friendly orgy. Tina would go to the orgy and not participate, she would come there to laugh at everyone. You guys don't understand. I'm the type of person to be invited to a party and then bring a book. <laughs> Honestly, same. Coming in. Can we do it? Can we do it? Can we do it? Oh no. Can we go to hype train? <laughs> you know what? Like, maybe it's a really bad idea to kill people that I'm doing this live because one, I'm pretty aggressive when I do these things. I make pretty fast, I have a pretty fast judgment. It, it it may sound it may seem like I am uh I guess uh really harsh. <laughs> Fight me. I cried really hard. Fight me. I literally shut off the stream and immediately jumped into a call with silence. Okay. Swing Listen, it's little... okay. It's fine. Why don't you just get an apartment with Iko and Danabo and you guys can compare the knives you used to fucking pull out of my back, okay? How about that? <laughs> what the also, fuck? title locking Walks is really life, cool. Cross path, okay? Some guys are talking, all right? They're talking about their experiences with the cops, you know? And one uh. guy is this black guy. But God bless Tina too. Huge lover of Poly Eclipse. I, I, I haven't gotten anything negative from Tina. I remember, okay, when I was still under the alias of Poly Eclipse, I was keeping the brand separate. I was being secret about it and things like that. I, I went to Tina's chat and I asked, can I use her clips? Do I have your permission? And she's like, yeah, 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 you can. And then, uh, and then like somebody in chat was like, aren't you Kurt? And then I had to type, I am not Kurt. And then Tina was like, well, now I'm suspicious that you're Kurt. I'm like, ah, shit, god damn it. <laughs> it was so funny. But then uh, I think like the next streamer after Tina, no, that was the same day. That was the same day that IRI, that I, I had to uh, talk to IRI, and that whole thing went down. Holy shit. Okay, but uh, I just haven't... I've only heard great things about Polyclips from Tina, and uh, Tina's been really supportive. Watching the videos on stream, uh, trying to get her viewers to subscribe and things like that. Really, really appreciate that. Is Dylan still watching Polyclips? I have no idea. Dude, I haven't published a video in a couple of days. Uh, that's all me. I've also been really busy. But I think so. I think so. Does she do the clips? I, I don't know. I don't think any streamer does their own clips. Uh, except for Mark Monkey. Mark Monkey does. Mark Monkey's been playing the game. Uh, I, I want that to actually happen, though, so... It's it's not unethical for streamers to make your own clips, not at all. It's not unethical for streamers to request their own clips to be on poly clips. It's not unethical for streamers to say don't put this clip in. But if you don't want this clip to be in, you probably should just delete the clip. Um, she watches them as soon as they come out. Yeah, it seems like it. The average clip people make is awful. I I've been meaning to make like a couple of videos for poly clips, not compilations, but uh, it would be a like, what is poly clips? That's one video. And another video would be how to make a good clip. That's a... Uh... And then uh, another would be, oh, how do I choose? Like, what is my methodology to choosing the clips? Uh, that's the kind of information that uh, should be more public, but I, I've just been really busy. Uh, yeah, I can see themselves doing it. Makes sense. However, they don't really get the view count at Senpai. <laughs> no, they don't. Apparently, it, it, it does not translate. Uh, me being Polyclips is not as big of a deal as people want it to be. Even though, uh, right in front of me, I have probably one of the most 
diverse Twitch politics content that there is on this platform. And it's because, well, I'm just watching other people's content. All right, Trash Can, what do you got for me? Oh, yeah. To me, Super Mario was always a friend. To me, Super Mario was always something of a father figure. We did everything together. We had parties. We played sports. Oh, we had fun sure. and wacky adventures. And those would end up being some of the greatest memories of my life. Da 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 Sorry, guys. Uh, isn't it advertising for smaller streamers to have good clips and poly clips? Absolutely. 100%. In theory, socialists will defend a complete abolition of the capitalist mode of production, but then when called upon to defend historical or theoretical examples of capitalism, they'll retreat to definitions that don't fall within their existing definition. Of In Bosh, what the fuck are you saying? I, I, I need to prepare. Why did I open a Bosch clip and not prepare for some five head shit? Okay. In theory, socialists will defend a complete abolition of the capitalist mode of production. Okay, socialists will defend the complete abolition of the capitalist mode of production. But then when called upon to defend historical or theoretical examples of capitalism. But then when called to def but why would they why would they defend historical modes of capitalism? That doesn't seem very socialist. They'll retreat to definitions that don't fall within their existing definition of socialism. They'll retreat to definitions of what? Of capitalism that doesn't translate to their current definition of socialism? Imagine if I advocated relentlessly for worker cooperatives and like uh, okay. worker owned economies. Okay. But then okay. somebody criticized. All right. All right. Okay. So socialists will defend the complete abolition of capitalism. However, when it comes to actually uh, thinking or proposing policies or a direction in order to abolish this capitalism, they will instead use, uh, they will instead be attacking historical modes, uh, the historical capitalism, which does not fit the current form of capitalism. So, for example, maybe a co-op back then would have worked really, really well under that framing of capitalism, but it does not work very well under our current form of capitalism. And I was like, wait, 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 hold on. Socialists have done amazing work pushing for social security and welfare in America. Okay. But that's not... That's not the thing I was arguing on right now. Wolf was saying he socialism was a movement rather than a specific definition. That's bullshit. You do realize that's bullshit, right? If a person says, I don't believe socialist economies work, can you provide a definition of socialism? And then you spend five minute wind wheeling. Actually, socialism is a movement. There is no specific definition. Here are three definitions. Which one do I believe in? Guess you'll just have to guess. <laughs> All right, that's kind of funny. Um, Richard Wolf came off like an arrogant asshole the entire time. This goes beyond the, the reasonable expectation of like an older academic ta talking to like a Zoomer live streamer. Was he really Wednesday? did come off like an incredibly arrogant asshole. I guess it was. Um, not just him talking constantly and interrupting constantly. The very first time Destiny said anything after the end of his opening statement, Richard Wolf inter like ended it angrily and then chastised Destiny for making prescriptive statements about socialists. That was very weird. He came off very angry. Oh. Man, now, now I'm not sure. These two clips are pretty good. Wolf looks so bad. What is going on? Lance of the Surfs. Lance of the Surfs said, um, uh, asked a final question saying, under socialism, can I still get my PS5? And Richard Wolf was like, yeah, sure, but you're gonna have to make a democratic decision. You're gonna have to work with your, with the people that you work with. You're gonna have to talk and negotiate. And it's like, oh my God, what? Yeah, it's like, it's a really, really weird answer. Like, what is he advocating for? He never even said what he's advocating for. 
Is he advocating for social democracy? Is he advocating for like worker oh, cooperatives? Yeah, right. Is he advocating for the government control? If it's worker cooperatives, then we're still maintaining a market economy, which means that you would just say- God damn it, all of these clips are good! Vosh! To the okay. Vosh gives me the hardest time. Vosh always comes in with five clips, but these are five quality clips. I am just, I, I always have a really hard time picking out Vosh's. Vosh's clips. You're really tired and sad. How you doing? Uh, well, I am also. Well, I was tired this morning and I was sad this morning, but uh, later in the day, I got more more happy. Uh, I've also been going through things. If you don't know, uh, I don't want you to know. I really don't care. But yeah, Larry Potato quality. Vosh quality. To the people who are saying that nothing matters here beyond the positions they're defending, then you don't actually believe in debate, okay? You, then I don't know why you watch me. Um, I don't want you guys to watch me because you already agree with what I have to say. That's super cringe. I want you to watch me because the ways in which I de deliver my opinions, the, the ways I argue in favor of the things that I believe are sound, or you think they're valid, or you think they're convincing. Um, so if... Not Cat, what happened to the? Oh, I thought this was a drama-free zone. I thought I was safe. Ah! Do you think Destiny is a hardcore capitalist realist, or is he stubborn? Wow, Larry. Now I know why a lot of people really appreciate you being in in their chat. I really appreciate you being in my chat. That was that's a really pock statement. We are happy that I'm happy that we're all here. Okay. No, he's a hardcore capitalist realist, 100%. Do you think Destiny is a hardcore capitalist realist, or is he stubborn? No, he's a hardcore capitalist realist, 100%. Destiny LARPs as some sort of logic agent who only has problems with alternative solutions to capitalism because um, because they like don't meet his uh, standards for possible solutions. But in reality, Destiny fervently argues against every kind of possible I'm systemic change. Destiny doesn't want the Senate reformed or abolished. Destiny doesn't want to push for additional statehood, like as severely as leftists do. Destiny doesn't want to get rid of lobbying or address it, like, meaningfully in any, like, substantive way, it seems. Um, Destiny doesn't want to even get rid of the Electoral College, which is practically a fucking mainstream democratic position in some place. Like, in every systemic regard, Destiny has no, like, meaningful solutions or arguments. It seems like he moves away from positions when lefties like them, you know? Oh my god. We have a Vosh clip calling out socialists. We have a Vosh clip calling out Richard Wolf. We have a Vosh clip calling out people who hate debate bros. We have a Vosh clip calling out Destiny. Who the fuck is this? What, what to do the you people do who are saying that nothing matters here beyond the Okay, no. This is the clip going against the Oh, this is a clip again. Oh my god, Vosh! What am I doing? What are I doing? Chat. Chat, 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 you have to help me. Which which clip do I pick? Do I just do I do a, a random number generator? Do I just uh, pick a random num random number one to five? Like, uh, put 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 two of them. I I I want to put two of them, but here's the thing. Here's the question: Which two? If you tell me to pick like which five and be like, I'll put all of them. Uh, which four? That that's still pretty tough because you're excluding one of them, and they're all really fucking good. All right, the Destiny one for sure. I agree. I agree. Uh, debate bros, maybe not. Calling out Wolf and Destiny. Um, Richard Wolf came off like an arrogant, incredibly arrogant. Okay. You're just talking about arrogance? A lot of people already get that sense. In theory, socialist. This is two. I'm gonna. All right, I I I I kept on saying that was a really hard decision, but it, it seemed like it was really fast that I did it. Okay, I'm telling you, it was it was a hard decision. Wicked Supreme. Give me the cat smarts. What is cat smarts? What is cat smarts going to do? I'm listen. My cat and I share affection in a bunch of different ways. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> do I try to be wholesome? I do have to try to be wholesome a little bit. I do have to tone down certain jokes that I would certainly make I in private. And listen, I beg you not to ask me what that means. You're in. You're in supreme. I got you. 
All right, this is it. Temp, cut, paste, run the code, run the code, generate description, put overlays, and we're going to go to temp is now done. We have finished day one backlog. Moving on to whew, a bunch of clips here. Bunch of folders here. Do I? Is there any of me? No, no. Oh, guess what? Kaboom. Goodbye. You're done. What? He has a special relationship with his cat. I wonder what that means. Vosh is the whitest person on Twitch. All right, Aiko. What do you got to say about Vosh? Tap to the solar plexus. I gotta say, but you know what? Did I die from it? No, I did not die from it. That is the thing. I, I honestly think, like, I still stand by, like, uh, um, triggering. If you can, <laughs> if you can trigger a white person into, like, not caring about social justice anymore or, like, uh, the liberation what? of oppressed, uh, what? What do you mean? What? Why would you want that? That's less social justice than more of the other. Okay, so like what are the best clips? Like out of context, below cakes, drama, I don't know. There are four categories. Five categories, really. The first category is hot takes. The second category is just wholesome niceness. I and mean, I, I really like that stuff. If you're if you're gonna have a human moment on stream and that's a clip, I actually have a bias over that. Then there's the drama, uh, and the the drama is like calling out other streamers or a shout fest or whatnot. And then uh, another category, the fourth one is fun. Okay, if you're funny, if the clip is funny, if you're just having a laugh or yeah, there's a joke, uh. Then the fifth one is the uh, it's, it's kind of close to funny, but it's different. It's live stream fails. So those are the five categories that I have when choosing clips. And uh, the thing about it is they all have to be good. So it doesn't really matter the category, but I have categories in my head. You have to fit yourself. Your clip has to be fitting in one of those categories, which is pretty much all encompassing. And then that clip has to be good. And I, I don't know how I could explain to you my methodology on what that, that clip is good. If it's a hot take, it better be concise, I guess. If it's going to be funny, a, a, a funny clip, well, it better be fucking funny. If it's going to be a live stream fail, well, you, you better fail epically. Uh, if there's going to be drama, Context. Context is really important for drama. Uh, blah, 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 blah. What is the other thing? Wholesome. It's yeah, just niceness. Uh huh. I don't like dead silence. I don't like clips that get cut off in the beginning or in the end. I don't like clips that are longer than they necessarily need to be. And I don't like clips who that are shorter than they necessarily need to be. That's a pretty good summary of just offhand giving it to you guys. <laughs> wow, Larry Potato. This is your first time ever taking notes and it's about clips. Uh, matter much what to title it. Titles will be ver soon very important. I won't tell you why. But titles will soon be very, very important. Title your fucking clips. Why are both of these clips the same title? It's because if you don't title them, then it's going to be the title of the stream. You see this? I don't think Seven that... Seven seconds in. Like, I think that... Um, I don't think that he was... Uh, he seems like he was just being very like condescending and trying to like make Destiny look stupid versus Wolf. This is about actually Wolf. trying to like explain things in a way that like uh just 
Damn. Why is everybody saying the same thing? He's just being condescending. Even Vice says he's just being condescending. I do need Goldilocks clips. Not too long, not too short. All right, Bad Bunny. Give it to me. What the fuck is this? Pussy! Pussy! <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad she was on board with you. Me too. Me too. All right. You know, like, God, you know who I really miss being on Poly Clips? I miss Central Committee. I miss Mike from PA. All right. You can say whatever the shit you want, but Mike from PA actually has. S tier clips. I don't know if there was any video before the reveal that didn't have a Mike from PA clip. Mike from PA definitely had at least one clip or two in every single video before the reveal. And he didn't I, I messaged him, he didn't respond to me. I'm really sad. I'm really sad that he's not on Poly Eclipse. <laughs> Say what you want about his opinions and how he interacts or whatnot, but his his clips are fucking golden. <laughs> All right, I'm back. Hello, I'm looking at the chat. I think it's the job of the moderator to not let one of the debate participants oh give. Oh my god, I watched I watched the entire vod of book smarts. He's gonna your blow responses up. to questions. Did you pay attention to who the moderator was? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I don't expect a lot out of the serfs, to be quite frank with you. Um, in every debate review I've done of the serfs, uh See? Drama right there. Drama right there. Carpe packs. Operating Twitter or operating That's not how this works. That That's not how any of this voting. works. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. So <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was that was really convenient. I know you are, but where the man? Uh, <laughs> to hear a grown man say that. Uh, thank you, sir, for girl Philly. I love you. Wait, why is this text green? Thank you, sir, for girl Philly, for buying exercises at the very end of my stream. Um, well, the guillotine has been out of fashion. Yeah, but I didn't know that you could change, you could change it. I'm keeping that. Chud Logic, Chud Logic also a gold mine. Listen, I can be a bit bigoted towards the French, all right? Then my fucking listen, the English and the French have got history going back fucking decades, centuries, all right? If I want to shit on the French, that's my fucking right as an Englishman, all right? Fuck you, okay? Fuck you if you want to you want to say I can't shit on the French. That's an old tradition thing. Dude, why? All of these clips so far have just been funny live stream fails. What happened? I don't know. I don't understand. There are just certain days in which it's all hot takes, and then there are certain days it's all live stream fails, or there are certain days it's all funny. Hey, there's no coordination between all streamers. What's going on? It's like there's some horoscope shit going on. All right? I'm actually a bit getting pilled on the horoscope shit. Okay, it feels like just on a, on a certain day when the stars are aligned in a certain way, everybody makes a certain type of clip. Oh, okay. uh, hello. <laughs> oh, okay. And because I have finished. A process clip. So then I go through all these. Okay. Is there a picture <laughs> on Twitter or whatever? Okay. So. All right. So this this is funny. And I, I order the clips. There's an order to the clips in the videos. If you guys haven't realized. Uh, this is funny. I think so. 20. It would be a red event reacting to the surf. Right? Okay, and this is also funny. 
wolf looks so bad. This is a hot take. 40. Thanks. I eat babies. <laughs> live stream fail. I'm. Listen, my. Another live stream fail. Do you think Destiny is a hardcore capitalist? Oh, drama. Drama right here. 30. Boom. And this is what, like, Dylan Burns viewers. Drama, drama, Jill and Burns, boom. Uh huh. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I called it. Yeah, the thing is, they just measure success completely differently. Destiny is going to be measured. Wow. What a showman. Such a showman. You want to see the infrared code? Fine, I'll show you the infrared code. I love you. And this is what, like, Dylan Burns viewers think of the media, right? They think that CNN is like, well, we're here at CNN, we're an unbiased... <laughs> oh, man. Why do I have to be busy? I honestly love doing this. I love watching these clips and being just like, what the fuck is going on with these people on this channel, on this platform? <laughs> oh my god. It's Project Birdie is from Infrared. <laughs> you don't know who you've been in Dylan's community for a year? I don't think I've seen that. <laughs> Alright, this is what- this is funny. Gas, 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 we'll just spend the gas tonight. So anyway. what, uh, um, what, who are some other, like, streamers that- Uh, th see, this is wholesome. This is, this is awesome, wholesomeness. And the homophobia ratcheted up. Now, my church didn't know what trans people were. They And this is a take. Black versus white. It this is also a take. Three. Someone. Did this is a fail. Holy shit, that's a big gun! I know. I do like guns. <laughs> oh, Anna. Oh, Anna. It was okay. Okay. Now here's the 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 big question. Okay, who do we put in the very front of this video? Okay, the first clip is always the most important. Gotta give it a wash. I gotta give it a wash. I, infrared comes at like a, a second. A close second. But gotta give it a wash, okay? And also want Destiny on this. God damn it. Destiny, stop ignoring the plebeians in your DMs, okay? Respond to shit. I should, I should email. I should email. I haven't gotten around to like actually uh, contacting people who I want to be on Poly Clips. Uh, <clears throat> specifically, I should be more direct. Destiny, big fan. Uh, I I've definitely never been critical of you, so you're putting that together. Algorithm go run. Algorithm goes burr. And back to back to oh, getting here. So we're on Demon Mama. Demon Mama, what do you got for me? All right. Give me something good. Privacy of their own home. No more inconvenient trips to the range. <laughs> no what is this guy? Who is this guy? Effective way to train in the safety and privacy of their own home. No <laughs> He's, he assumed the doo doo position. Begin. Is this the worm guy? I could put you on poly clips. Yeah, if you stream. The poo poo position. Uh, what about it, what about a chimney sweep or wait, a, can or I, a can poo I, yeah, or okay. like a poo scooper? Yeah, sure, poo okay. scooper. Poo if scooper, I'm a poo okay. scooper and I make eighty grand a year, I I must be really good. First off, wow, but damn, man. I make You're eighty grand all a year. That poop. You like you use your mouth and everything. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. I suck it all up and I spit it all out. All right, because I'm dumb and because this is chat, I can't tell if you're being serious. Do you actually want me to put you on poly clips? Then I will judge your clips every single Saturday night. Hey, it's Chase. What's up? Wait, let's see. Uh, is Chase here? No, Chase isn't here because uh, Chase is a bad streamer who doesn't get clipped. Uh, Chase is also not here because he's a bad streamer and doesn't get clipped. 
uh, Chase is also not here because he's bad, and also I think it's because he's a liar. Uh, Chase, where the fuck were you? <laughs> you heard what I said about the French? <laughs> what did I say about the French? I completely forgot. Are you going to Red's channel now? <laughs> oh. You haven't streamed? Didn't you? Come on. You streamed one of these days, okay? There, there are so many days in which I am just gone. Okay, poop uh, what, about, what about a chimney sweep or a poo scooper? Yeah, sure. Poo okay. scooper. Poo if scooper, I'm a poo okay. scooper and I make 80 grand a year, I'm, I must be really good, first off. Wow, but damn. Yeah. I make You're 80 grand a year. Poop. You, like, you use your mouth and everything. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. I suck it all up and I spit it all out. <laughs> oh my god, what is with these clips? Yep, y'all. What, what was this day? This day, uh, this is this is temp two. That was Wednesday. This is a Thursday, dude. There's something there's something up with Thursdays. You were drunk and it turns out your stream was muted the whole time. Wow. Red, did you even turn on VODs for your stream? Yep, you all know my real name now. Congratulations. My real name is uh, Alden. There's no way. Is Alden a real name? Here's how you make a Doom movie. Ready? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a Doom movie right now. Wait. Did she say Doom or Do? And what's Do? Like doing or like do-do? Open. Open. Hell. Hell. Okay? Immediately. Crawling demons. Wrestling around. Okay? Mm, because so that's hard this because my... my why, why, why? Why? What is going on here? Why is this happening? It was like, okay, Straight. he posted that to like divert us away from the other one. Plus, he corrected himself in the powerlifting story, which makes me think he was trying to get it straight because of their he could have just like, all right, poot scoop it is. Big fan of poot scoop denims, please. Denims, I, I can't, I can't count on denims to not give a stupid clip. Any single part that I talk about in this debate, no, oh my god, wait, denims actually has a hot. <laughs> <laughs> Any single part that I talk about in this debate, I am assuming both parties are being completely good faith. I am assuming both parties are doing the best that they can to engage with the facts. And I'm assuming both parties are trying to make the best arguments that they can to get to the best conclusion that they can. Okay? Cool. If we're all on... Wow. Not, not really substantive, but I'm actually really impressed. You're well, not obligated to do any of that. You're, you're not obligated to do any of that. You have a fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders. Of course if you, you do. If you read, if you t take my advice, I teach these courses. If you read what fiduciary responsibility means, it's an abstract generalization. It can be easily demonstrated in thousands of legal cases oh God, that there is no that obligation yeah. of any yeah. material sort that they return have have a good night chase okay i'll see you in Ico's chat amorphous it absolutely is amorphous even your oh, definition of capitalism is absolutely amorphous um where i, I hear no, you're just not familiar with it. i'm absolutely <laughs> familiar with it I, like I, I absolutely <laughs> am able to if you would like to ask me for my definitions of any of these things i would be glad to have okay i'm done God, I'm telling you, dude, I need the confidence. I need the confidence that white men have, okay? I'm done. I'm, I'm done not having the confidence of fucking white men, all right? Like, can you imagine the audacity to, like, tell someone who's been... There's somebody named Trans Rights USSR. Like, writing books and studying this for like twice the time that you've been alive and then be like, why don't you ask me for my definition? That is such insane, insane audacity. I need to have this fucking, this, this fucking, uh, like, oh man, he's Cuban denims, baby la, baby la. Oh my God, dude. I need this, I need this confidence. I need to, I need to like fucking steal it. God damn. Correct me, professor. You've never seen all the Stalin says trans rights uwu memes? <laughs> Wait, memes? You mean... Oh. So this is his criteria. A socialist party must include all three of the following. 
in order to be, in fact, a socialist nation, in which case he's saying Portu Port Portugal, yeah, had this exact thing. And that's why we can call it a socialist party and a socialist movement. So Wait. this is his criteria. A socialist countries, parties, they call themselves socialists. The party is called a socialist party and the policy of the party are socialist. Socialist party must include all three of the following in order to be, in fact, a socialist nation, in which case he's saying Portu Port Portugal. Wow. Fuck it. Fuck it. Big fan. Big fan. We're, we're finally able to get a substantive hot take clip so far, and it's come from the most unexpected of persons. Fucking denims. Fucking denims. You know what, like... So, so Kat, obviously, you're, you're very aware of the drama that goes on. Do you really want to save space? All right, Dylan. It's it oh, no, it's the Dylan no common chick arc. It's in relation to that. You tell me that somebody didn't try to say, hey, let's go after Dylan's political career. I'll post it. You're going to tell me that any of these things, I'll post them individually, okay? So let me be very clear. I'm not threatening to dox. I'm threatening to correct the record if you lie about me on anything I've said here today. That's not TOS to say, hey, if you lie about me, I'll post the DMs. Remember when I did that for Endernax? When I have these conversations, when I do these things, I don't go into it blindly just throw Holy shit. Uh, do I still talk to Irene? Some of us worried about her, to be honest. I do not talk to Irene. Morgan quote tweeted me. And uh, she did, like, send a message because of you to me. Uh, uh, I, I, I really don't know what's going on. Um, I guess, like, I, I do have some thoughts in that there's kind of been a pattern in Irene crying, I'm getting canceled, public publicizing that. It, it, it seems like a strategic thing, but it, it's, it's so constant now that I can't help but think that it might be something else. And then I, Irene has like, there, a couple of months ago, there was a bridge burned between Irene and somebody else who completely came out of left field. Like it was so unexpected. I did not expect that to happen. Um, definitely, I, Irene seems to be like, I want to say like uh, playing a, 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 the role of the villain. A lot of, a lot of people don't like her, um, and a lot of people have been distancing. I don't know if this is like good for her viewership. I don't know if this is just like something that she's genuinely doing. There's a lot of speculation going on, but yeah, I'm a bit worried too because it's definitely getting like, like look at Dylan. Look at how it's in how serious Dylan is is taking this. Like, look at his facial expressions. This guy's not acting. This guy's being dead fucking serious. And then, like, what's really also strange is that, like, Irene's playing into it. Irene's been tw tweeting constantly about it. And we're like, uh, now I'm like, do you, do you want this to get solved? Do you not want this to get solved? Do you want this to continue? And then, like, some people are speculating that, oh, wow, this is coincidentally uh, happening along the, so along the lines of, um, like, when she started to put partner push in her titles. Um, and then, like, there's been DMs and stuff. Damn, it's, it's a hot mess. It's a hot mess. That's good. I'm glad you was able to find someone to help. <laughs> well, guess what? Now I'm going to get a medical bill. <laughs> it's going to be like $100 because uh, they took my vitals. I caught her, no comment trick on Tom Florey panel with Chalogic over a week ago, and she was kind of yikes. I I heard. I was just jumping down Rob Noir's throat. I see. Uh, she was doing some weird shit. I don't know, man. It's multi-factor IMO. People freaking hate her. I don't know a good solution. Her chat simultaneously keeps her going, but also I think it's leading her to to bad behaviors. Um, there, I I remember this one conversation that I had with Irene, in that um she she is really dedicated to using the strategy of using haters to her advantage. Uh, like take for example a really good person who does this is Logan Paul. 
And um, I, I think she's playing into this way too much because it, it, it's going to backfire. She's not going to get the interaction. She's not going to be getting uh, the opportunities to go on other people's panels. Uh, there's a difference between being hated. Oh, no. There's a difference between being uh, viewed as a villain and being uh, just like a, a thorn in the side of somebody. Because the, the former, you get attention. The latter, you just get ignored. You just straight up get ignored. And a, a lot of people like are kind of getting on the hang of, of ignoring. Take, for example, Mel. Uh, Mel very recently was going from stream to stream to stream to stream uh, talking about some things and being really, uh, frankly, annoying on Twitter. Um, and like people have just realized that, okay, we're just going to straight up ignore her. And I haven't heard anything from Mel or anything about Mel that's like been blowing up uh, from other people's uh, quote tweets that are like, yeah, I think people are finally catching on that. Like if you really want something to die, you just ignore it. Just leave it alone. Uh, let it be within its own echo chamber. Uh, you fighting against it isn't going to break that echo chamber. So, uh, yeah. This is getting beyond haters, exactly. Yeah, agreed. She's doing it so badly. I think she's trying a similar thing to Demon Mama, but she's so clumsy about it. It's weird though because it it definitely seems like there is a team. There's but there are influencers behind it, and I I have no idea if they're really looking out for the best. It's it's weird. I always thought she and Dylan were chill. No, she was chill with a lot of people. She had her own show. She had Bird Brings. Bird Brings was one of the the most delighted shows on this platform. It was in contention. It, it was the same time slot, or it conflicted with um, it conflicted with uh, what call it hippy dippy but like people still went on it people went on both shows um and like it, it, it there, there was something going on like yeah dylan would go on to irene's show irene would go on to dylan's show and it it, it was fine but it, it seems like there's um i don't know man so, something happened something happened um i it definitely i i think it started when irene started to distance herself from from what was her uh, dedicated audience at that time, which was the the leftists. Like, the Bird Brains, Bird Brains was a leftist show. The furthest right person was me. Probably, okay? There was no uh, conservatives, Republicans. There was no right people on Bird Brains. Bird Brains was a dedicated left-leaning show. It was... Where that there was always going to be an argument between the centrists, between the liberals, and the leftists. But then there was a falling out. There was a falling out, and I, I think that's when it started. Like, and then uh, Garbine started to revitalize uh, Bird Brains by like having it on Prime Kai's. Like, I, Irene definitely seems like there's a pattern of behavior that Irene is hunting for people. For example, a couple of weeks ago when Prime was dealing with a lot of the Kurt shit, that uh, Irene was like, yo, let's revitalize Bird Brains and have it on Monday and conflict it with the Reverie Roundtable. They didn't go well for the, the Bird Brains. They, they got some viewers. There are always going to be those viewers, but um, it's like, okay, if it's not Prime, and then the, the next step is what? Demon Mama, and then what? And then it's... Um, and then it's it's Dylan, and then and then what's next? I, I don't I don't fucking know. If it's going to be me, no, it's not going to be me. Cut them out. Uh, that are libertarian ones, but never again. All right, libertarian. All right, Dylan, you going mask off? Okay, so number one, lip cuck, we do. It's called the Second Amendment. You unpatriotic socialist. That's the first thing. Second thing is, I understand that Democrats are pro MS thirteen, but you don't need to make it so unbelievably obvious that you're on the sides of the gangs. Okay, so what we're gonna say is that everyday Americans and these terrorists on our streets can go around with firearms and their and their evil evil ideology and Rachel Maddow led MS-13 and bring the <laughs> Okay, alright you, You'll never ever forget it This time's brothers and sisters 
this time, brothers and sisters, we're gonna go on a hate campaign of using people's pronouns that they want you to use for them. I know it's dastardly. I know it's evil. I know it's bad. But we, we are, we have taken too much. We I don't know where Dylan finds this music. No comment chick planning to attack me, trying to manipulate Demon Mama against me. Um, and like certain mods suggesting going after my political career because of this whole disagreement. Um, I'll try... I, it's hard to like summarize everything that's already happened so far, so I'll, I'll just do it one more time quickly. Copyright. So basically, uh, I had the hippy dippy fatal four way, and during that stream, I referred to Demon Mama as she, her, and they. And some people told me that I shouldn't use they in reference to Demon Mama. So I go to Demon Mama and ask, should I use they for them? Demon Mama tells me, you, you know, it's fine. You can use they. I just don't like it when some people use they because they use it as a replacement for she, her to deny me being a woman. No comma chick reacted to this oh, with problems shit. with my platforming number one. Oh shit, I never thought about that. Oh no, I, I never thought about that. So my strategy for just being unaware of somebody's pronouns was just default to they because uh, they and their because it's just neutral. I never thought about how it could come off as denying somebody of their preferred gender role. Oh shit. Hot damn. I'm gonna have to sit on this. One, but then also said that I couldn't ask Demon Mama about her pronouns in that manner because I have power over her. And what the logs showed is that she thinks it's like an employee employer relationship and that. It's just a mod in their community. It's a TTS spot. You don't even. Damn, uh... Why? Hold on a second. Okay. Alright. It is time for me to go. It's time you go home. Soft day introduction is generally accepted, it seems. Thanks, ciao. Oh, thank you, man. 500 bits. It generally accepted, it seems, and some people are okay with it all the time. No competitor uh, does actually like she heard exclusively, but apparently they played up unhappy she was with they. I see. Maddie and Geek are both live. Big fan of Maddie. A geek is French. It's not about pro-trans in the abstract, it's about respecting someone's pronouns when they ask. If I know somebody's pronouns, I'm gonna use them. But then if I'm not if I'm not like really sure about uh like what those pronouns are, like if this is a new person, I generally would default to they. I, I really just I never really thought about the 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 implication that like, people would use they in order to deny somebody's preferred pronouns, or, or using somebody's preferred pronouns. That's, uh, I, I never thought of it. Okay, so, let's see. Uh, CTV's playing Halo. We are chilling, working on Dylan Overlay 2.0. Oh. Oh, well, Maddie's on a debate. Oh, it's the reverie. What are they talking about? I use they for cis people too. I don't know. Maybe it's such a dialect thing. Hey, uh, you know what? The, the right answer is always going to be this. It's a case by case basis. And uh, play it safe. Don't be that asshole who just, um who doesn't care about like it, it's it's so easy. Okay, put in a little bit of effort. Oh no, I'm- I'm- a, and, and then somebody's gonna bring up how doing it case by case is also problematic. I'm like, oh no, there's just, just... Never- never an easy solution. Never an easy solution. Uh... Where am I sending you guys?
No, I'm sending you guys to the geek. Because I want you guys to have a chill night. If you stayed for my... Uh, the, the, the stream stream, which was the lecture, you guys have learned plenty, heard plenty. You guys deserve this. Alright, so have a good night. Thanks for watching. Peace out. Wednesday, we're going over that article, the past, present, and future of intervention. Arigato for watching.